42 years. He not only served as charter member and president of his local Smoky Mountains section, he's also been a national director at large and a national <coughs> treasurer. But he is our national technical advisor and he's been giving presentations uh, of a technical nature at most NBCA national events for, you know, since 1986. So he's been doing this a while and he's very good at it. He's also doing uh, concourse judging at regional and national events. He's uh, got 30 years of experience uh, as a, in the nuclear engineering field, which is great background for working on cars. And he has uh, owned a lot of Mercedes, including a 190 SL, 250 Coupe, uh, and currently has GLK 350. He does most of the work on his own car. He also has a, a company called Performance Analysis that uh, where he sells some very unusual things that aren't available elsewhere, such as the servos for the uh, heating and air conditioning systems on the 450 SLs. So uh, if we were in a crowded room, I'd start clapping. I'd say, join me in welcoming George Murphy for our presentation on Care of Your Aging 107. George, thank you for doing this. It's great having you again. Oh, glad to do it. I, I enjoy it myself. And uh, I even pick up uh, information from everybody else. I guess I share a screen at this point. Yeah, that'd be good. And uh, where did it go? <laughs> That's not it. Oh, here it is. What am I doing? Okay. We have time. Let's see. I selected that. It should select the green button at the bottom so that's your screen. Uh, I click on share screen. Mm -hmm. And then I want to share this desktop. Uh, it doesn't come up. Dang. Let me, uh, let me do you this. You do have him as a host, right? Yeah, I think so. Double check. Everybody see that picture now? No, I'm not seeing it. No. We see your smiling face. Oh, darn it. Hang on. Uh, Pull this up. I'm trying to get it to share. Mm -hmm. um, Gary, do you have his presentation? I do not. At least I don't have the most recent uh, version of it. Um, hmm. Uh, I wonder. I selected it, but it doesn't come up. What happened here? Um, is George a host? Yeah, George is a host. Share. Click on that. Well, here, let me try something. Let me click on something else and go back to it. Share that. Yeah, mine seems to be coming up normally. Oh, multiple per participants. Maybe that's what the problem is. No, no, you need to say share screen. Not yeah, you're, 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 you need to go to share screen. Yeah. Just hit the just hit the green button, and then it should should ha show you like desktop, whiteboard, or you should get like a black panel. Yeah, it's just select the meeting I want. Well, let me try. My PowerPoint, it doesn't come up. I wonder what's going on here. Excuse me, uh, George? Yeah. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Matt. Have you opened the PowerPoint already? Yes. And when you go to share screen, what are you seeing in that window option? Well, there's several uh, screens showing, you know, from off my computer. Is the PowerPoint one of them or no? Yeah, aging. Yeah, my the PowerPoint is okay. one, and I click on it, nothing happens. Uh, double click it. That there better? Yep. yep. There you go. Yep. There you go. Here we go. <laughs> you get the prize of the day. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Operator error there. Okay. 
All right, well, uh, I found a nice picture. Thanks, Diana. I put a bunch of pictures in this. That was a good idea. Okay, good. So uh, we'll get started here. Uh, I'm going to start front to back, so to speak. And these cars, uh, well, some of them are close, close to 50 years old. So this is going to apply to people who are maybe had a car or maybe picked up one that's, I don't know, maybe it's got uh, 100,000 miles on it or more. Uh, so I'm talking, these are things that, that are worn out on a car that's been driven all these years. So uh, the key word is rubber. Motor mounts, usually they're pretty well worn. And the engine shock absorber and the bushing, <coughs> same thing. They, uh, they're pretty well shot by 100,000 miles. It's also a rubber transmission, transmission mount. And it is adjustable. And uh, if you get a, if you like to crawl into your car and look at it, there's, there's two bolts that run in a slot that hold that mount. You can loosen those bolts. And I've got a whole procedure that when I uh, do an engine, I loosen uh, everything and run the car till it warms up and then tighten those bolts because everything expands, you know, it gets hot and you want the maximum smoothness of your car, that's important. Um, probably everybody knows about the 82 and 84 V8s and 380 SLs. Had a single timing chain, and there was a conversion kit for a while, but apparently the, the kit is no longer available, but you can buy the, uh, the parts to convert if you want to. But if you have a 380 SL and it's got less than 60,000 miles on it, just put in a new chain every 60,000 miles. Because that was just the, the point of that whole problem was they had a single chain that was highly stressed and by 60,000 or a little bit more, it would fail. So uh, my rule of thumb is put a new chain in at 60,000 on a 380 SL if, if you have it. You can uh, check timing chain stretch to find out whether you should change it or not. Guides and temperatures on a high mileage engine will be worn somewhat. So be aware that you know, probably want to change those. Uh, same with the camshaft oiler tube. Pull the valve covers and look at them as a tube runs across the top of the uh, camshaft. And it squirts oil onto each one of the valves, <laughs> the valve mechanism. And uh, an engine that hasn't been taken care of quite as much, those uh, tubes get uh, plugged with crud. They're easy to take off and clean them and put them back on. Uh, moving back to... We'll get to the transmission and drive shaft. It's all in uh, rubber on these cars. There's an intermediate bearing and support support on rubber. They're usually shot by 100,000 miles. The flex disc can be, the front one takes uh, most of the work. So that's, that's when it starts to get go first. Uh, the drive shafts have U-joints and rarely fail or hardly even wear because this, this U-joint in the drive shaft, uh, there's negligible bearing uh, angle on it. So it lasts a long time. Some mechanics will pull the shaft out and and say they'll bend that U-joint up at a 45 degree angle. See it's worn out, you need a new one. Well you can't get a new one. They're 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 part of the shaft. But then don't worry about them. You can uh, you can test it by grab it uh, in front and in back of it and try to rotate the shafts and see if there's looseness in that tube. If it is loose, then you'll have to under, undergo a new uh, drive shaft. Really, uh, EFI, that's electronic fuel injection. Uh, I was just, I, I recommend every 10,000 miles, especially the six cylinder 110 engines. I've had a number of those. And uh, the European versions, I had a 280 SL Euro version. And uh, they specifically point out every 10,000. But it's a high performance engine, matter of fact. My 80 280 SL are faster than most 450 SLs in uh, club events, and uh, it, it's it's a neat engine to have, but you got you got to take good care of it. You have to know the idiosyncrasies. So uh, uh, we'll go on to the next one here. Automatic transmission. That's the next most expensive device on the car. And I recommend fluid and filter change between 30 and 40 thousand miles, and uh, it's not hard to do on these older transmissions. Uh, the torque converter can be drained if you know how to do it. I've got all these procedures written down. If any of you want to know them, email me. And I'll send you the procedure, all the little details. But uh, the torque converter and the cooler should be uh, drained also. 
Now, when you go to refill it, when you're all done, you've got the new filter in there and the pan on there, uh, it may take a slightly bit more than the book shows, okay? That's all right. Just put in, uh, well, let me get back off a little bit. If you're doing this job, put in four quarts, then start the car, then add two and a half to three more. If you try to add all of it at once, it's going to overflow right away. You have a puddle on the floor. So you start with four quarts, start the kit, start the engine. See, the, end, so the pump will fill the torque converter. See, the torque converter is not fulfilled until you start the car. That's why you only put in four quarts, and then after it runs a, a bit, you add the rest. And don't keep it clean. Uh, I've been on these cars, you know, you got the pan off the transmission. It's dripping fluid. It, they'll drip fluid for three weeks. So don't take a rag and, and blot it. Just let it drip. Put newspaper down and keep your head off under it. Uh, do wear rubber gloves when you're doing this job. This automatic transmission fluid is it's fairly benign, but this is the same. And that goes for any work you do on your car. Get some rubber gloves. Shift leakage bushes on a, on a well-used car, they'll be a little bit loose. You can tell it in the shift handle. They get loose enough, you know, you'll, you'll uh, have problems getting it in the right gear. And there's an adjustment on the shift linkage. That's the rod that goes from the bottom of the lower end of the shift lever over to a lever on the transmission. I don't know, it's about what, eight inches long or something. Don't mess with it. It was set at the factory. It can be adjusted, but don't mess with it. You'll mess up your, your relationship between the, the shift handle and the, uh, what gear the thing is in. So just be aware of that. Ignition systems, older cars, the Barclay wires, distributor cap and rotor, and uh, spark plugs too. I mean, will be pretty well worn, but uh, and, uh, that's on the previous owner where they took care of. Pre-75 cars have points and condensers. They're much like buggy whip of the ignition world. And uh, I sell the Pertronics. Uh, or I, I, I can get a crane, but this is what it looks like. Very easy to put in. It eliminates a lot of problems. Points and condenser, if you know, you know, you put in new points, you set it all up. As soon as you start the car and run a few miles, it starts to wear. And that wear continues through the life of the points. And uh, you never quite get anything. With electronic ignition, it never changes. I uh, First car I put on was my 71 250. I put one of these on. I never had to open the distributor cap again uh, once I set the timing. So. I do recommend them. I have them. Other people have them too. But uh, it's a good, good device change on the older cars. Rest the electrical system. Uh, I like to use the highest battery capable, uh, highest capacity battery available. I, Optima brand our AGM batteries, pretty high. They're cleaner and longer life. Um, they don't generate hydrogen gas. Uh, as, uh, uh, Let's see, I think so, 75. I forget which year, the, the batteries move back to the trunk inside a box. And if you change out a battery or even a regular battery, you want to check on it for safety. Make sure there's a rubber, a little holes leading from a, the battery out of the box and down to under the car. That vents off a hydrogen gas generated during uh, operation of the car, operation of the generator charging the battery. So uh, if you don't have that, it's a good idea to put it in there. Uh, that was another reason I like to go to the AGM batteries. Uh, belts on these cars uh, and the uh, belt tension, usually it's set by moving the alternator, make sure that's right. Regulator, alternator regulator brushes are replaceable on most Bosch alternators, especially the early ones. You can buy, just buy the brushes. Actually the brushes, it's, the regulator has the brushes in it. Do not attempt to buy just brushes, which you, I think you can still get. Just buy the, a new regulator, the brushes are already in it, and it's a simple thing to change on those early, uh, those older regular uh, alternators. So using around 125,000, you might see a degradation of alternator output. There's a simple way to check it. Uh, put a voltmeter on the battery terminals, make sure everything's turned off, run the engine at 1500 RPM, your uh, voltage output should be no less than 13.6 volts. That tells you your alternator and its regulator is and uh, is putting out well. And also tell you the condition of your battery. In my uh, experience, lead to acid batteries last about between four and five years. 
and they start to fail and, and over and over with a lot of different cars a failure even even the one in my wife's Prius a little tiny one and then wasn't wasn't a few months later a little tiny one in my GLK 14 GLK that one failed both of them were lead acid batteries needless to say they've been changed out with AGM batteries so <laughs> I hate lead acid batteries after four years uh, over voltage protection relay on 86 and newer cars. That's a relay, I think, is probably hidden above the fuse box. But anyway, you can identify that, that, that relay. It's got a little plastic cover on it and a fuse in there. It's one of those, I call them General Motors type fuse. They're the newer style fuse at the top. Uh, sometimes those can give you trouble on a high mileage car while well used, so it's, and they're not too expensive. So you can pick one up and uh, change it out. Electrical system in general, uh, somebody's jumped in on the thing. Uh, sometimes you get electrical problems with these cars just by reaching into the fuel fuse box. Here's a picture of a thing. Uh, they'll get oxidation on the end of the fuse. Just reach in there and rotate the fuse back and forth. If it looks good, you know, uh, but it, it, you, that whatever system it feeds is, is not working. Try rotating the fuse. That 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 uh, digs through any oxidation on the ends of the fuses. It's, it's a quick thing. I've I've done that a lot of times on a lot of cars. Uh, this is a picture of the fuse box in the SLs. Uh, normally there's a cover over it. Matter of fact, there's a usually a cardboard cover. Or it'll open a door, and all you can see is this much here. But if you take off, whoops, if you take off the uh, a panel above it, look at all these relays. <laughs> uh, they're for air conditioning, uh, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, there is a diagram for these relays in the shop manuals. So uh, now be aware uh, the climate control in the 77 to 81 car, or no, 78 to 81, with, a, with that, that servo in it. I'll show you that in a minute. There's an external fuse for that, and it's located in this area here someplace. Uh, this, this car doesn't have it, this particular picture, but uh, that external fuse is in an inline fuse. It's not down here, but it's an inline fuse up in here. Uh, another uh, cable or frame or wire be not that. between the, uh, that's very important in this car, especially if the engine or transmission has been removed from the car and put back in. I've seen professional mechanics forget to put the, the ground cable between the body and the transmission. Uh, usually it's landed on the transmission on a, a bell housing mounting bolt. There's a rated heavy duty cable that's connected to the body of the car. If you do not have that connected, you'll have all kinds of electrical problems. So just be aware of that, uh, that uh, cable. Very, very important, An engine to frame cable. It completes the DC circuit in the car because your battery, you know, has a, the negative cable attached to the, to the frame of the car, the body of the car, but uh, the starter and the alternator don't get any completion until that ground cable is connected too. So you get a complete circuit and everything will work nice. Otherwise you get some mysterious electrical problems. Sometimes you can burn things up pretty bad. Cooling system, I recommend a flush every three years. Uh, disconnect the, the hoses to the heater. There's a heater here. Disconnect these hoses and uh, take your garden hose and flush the heater too. And flush out all the engine that you possibly can. With, uh, there's a climate control servo up to 81. Those cars that have those disconnect the servo because when you turn the car off, it's almost closed and you can't get any water through it. So disconnect the hoses and flush those. I, re I recommend Mercedes-Benz brand antifreeze. Uh, my company, what I do, we rebuild, among other things, those climate control servos. And uh, I see what off-brand antifreeze does to the aluminum housings. It just eats through them. And it'll eat through your cylinder head and everything else, aluminum cylinder head, in time. So uh, the Mercedes-Benz brand, I recommend recommend only for the for these cars. Most of them are steel block with an aluminum head or, or even all aluminum. Uh, if you want to monitor your condition of the coolant, the pH should be between seven and eight. You can get a pH uh, measuring 
uh, I just go to Amazon. They've got all kinds of, I've got a nice little kit that samples it and, and uh, tells me what the pH is. I do that on all my cars just to make sure the coolant is between seven and eight because uh, of course if it goes above eight, it's alkaline, that really eats up aluminum. If it goes below seven, that's acidic. It's not so good either. Uh, I like to use Redline water wetter in an older car. Uh, what that does is, is it uh, it reduces the film boiling where the, where the hot coolant or the coolant is against the hot engine and it, it uh, imp improves the heat removal capability of the coolant. So I like to use that, uh, and especially in an older car. Um, when, when you change your antifreeze, uh, put in the requisite, requisite amount from Redline. You go to redline.com and buy it. Uh, probably auto parts stores have it too. Water pump lube is always a good thing, especially an older engine. The water pumps have, uh, interesting enough, here you recognize it, the seals are identical to the seals in a nuclear power plant primary coolant pump. Believe it or not, it's just a matter of size. <laughs> the uh, the uh, water pump in a Mercedes-Benz uh, water pump seal is strictly a carbon rotating on a polished ring. Same as the giant cooling pumps on a nuclear power plant. <laughs> I've worked on both. But anyway, Water pump lube helps keep that fresh, and it's always a, a little bit of that is always helpful, especially in the older cars. Power steering fluids. Uh, I recommend a change 30,000. Uh, you can do that at the same time you do your transmission, between 30 and 40,000. And there's a filter in the power steering. Here's a picture of a typical pump, and this device number 41, that, that's really a ring if you pull all those gubbins out of the way. You see it, it's a kind of an orange ring in the older cars. It's, if it's been changed and it's got an aluminum uh, pancake on it, it looks like a hockey puck, about the size of a hockey puck. That's a newer style filter, but do plan on changing the filter when you change fluid. Uh, up to 89, they all take automatic transmission fluid. You don't have anything special. You can buy special from Mercedes, it'll cost an arm and a leg, but up to 89, automatic transmission fluid is the same in there. Uh, I have a neat way of doing a flush. I disconnect the reservoir return holes and aim it at a bucket under the car, and I uh, open up the, the pump, of course, the top of the pump, and, uh, bef and this is uh, before changing the filter. Start the engine, and it'll, and it'll pump fluid through, of course, with the return hose disconnected, it goes down to a bucket. So stand by with three, three or four quarts of uh, fresh fluid to pour in, make up what leaves. And when you see clean fluid coming out of the flush line in the bucket, turn off the car, all right? And while the car is running, cycle or have a friend cycle the steering wheel back and forth. You'd be surprised how much crud is not loose, and you can see it coming out in that hose. So that's a that's a good thing to do. I don't know, you can do it every thirty thousand miles, but if you acquire a high mileage, well used car, uh, that's one of the things you should do is change the power, change the fluid. Now don't don't worry about memorizing all this. Just contact me if you want the procedure. I'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, but that, this, I've really, uh, as a matter of fact, I've restored power steerings that were jerky when you tried to turn by doing this cleaning, uh, the flushing, put a new filter and everything. Power steering worked just fine. You know, I'm, I'm concerned some people get sold and pumped that they don't need. Brake fluid, flush it every three years. Every, every three years. I like to use uh, ATE Tevis brake fluid or Mercedes-Benz fluid, which is made by Pentosil. Okay, use either two up to DOT4 on our cars. You don't have to go to the fancy f fluids, no more than DOT4. Pressure bleed is the most effective uh, versus pushing the pedal. On ABS cars, you're not going to get a good flush by pushing the pedal on an ABS car. You must use a pressure bleed. Whoops, not that. Uh, a pressure bleed uh, on ABS cars. Non-ABS, you can pump it with the pedal if you want to. I, I bought a little pressure bleeder, it works beautiful, and uh, it's the most effective way to do it. Don't use silicone fluid. All it does is it prevents the, uh, it does not absorb moisture like regular fluid. It lets the moisture accumulate in little blobs in the, in the fluid. And these blobs will work their way down to the pistons in the calipers. and cause rust. 
That's why brake fluid is, is uh, what it is. It absorbs moisture over time and should be flushed, but silicone fluid, uh, that's for race cars and stuff like that, but don't use it on our cars, especially ABS cars. I found new hoses every 15 to 20 years. This is a hose off of uh, my 89 300E. I was getting it ready for time trials. I was up there messing around. Uh, I think I put, and I looked at my brake hose and there was a bulge in it. And I thought, whoa. So I immediately changed all of the car was at that time was 15 years old. I've since seen this on three other Mercedes Benz between 15 and 20 years old. I've seen little bulges in the hoses like this. So plan on hose change if you buy a car. That's one of the things you got to do, put hoses, uh, new brake hoses there. If they don't have any bulges, if they're more than 15 years old, I would put new ones on. Exhaust systems hung by rubber donuts on our cars. And uh, they isolate exhaust vibrations and noise very effectively. Muffler life, well, you know what I do? because the, the muffler in, in our Mercedes-Benz is way at the back. By the time the exhaust gas reaches it, it's cooled off quite a bit, and the moisture in it, especially on a cold morning, has condensed, and the water ends up in the muffler. And eventually, it rusts through your muffler, very expensive. I've always drilled a 1 8 inch drain hole in the low point of the rear muffler. And on a cold morning and a cold startup, watch the water pouring out of that hole. It's not living life in your uh, in your muffler, so that's, that, that'll prolong the life of it. Catalytic converters, you don't well if you still have it, and if your car I think is over 25 years old, and you're told you need one, unless your your state requires it, you can get rid of it. But they're very expensive. Uh, if you change one, make sure you get a credit for the catalytic converter. Uh, there are recyclers that recycle the um, uh, the elements out of the catalytic converters if you have to buy one. Exhaust system brackets and U-bolts, I guess those next series, but uh, if you have to do uh, exhaust, even from the, from the resonator back, anything else, you have to uh, accommodate the growth of the system when it gets hot. I've only seen this in one shop manual, but anyway, at the back, muffler. If you look, uh, there's a rubber bumper. Let me, let's go over that and I'll show you maybe. Um, yeah, here it is. See this little rubber bumper? Here's the back muffler. And there's a little steel pad here that will, that will go against that. And here's the, uh, the clamps that hold it. But if you've got to replace all this stuff, even from here on, it doesn't matter. If you've got to replace this stuff, uh, do not, uh, let, let it heat up and you'll notice that it, it moves 10 millimeters to the back as it gets hot because all this pipe expands with heat and it expands and then it will match up with this little bumper. But if you tighten everything up and you can't uh, let it move to its hot position, you get a lot of stress in and that stress uh, ends up being noise or harshness in the car. And I can feel it driving one of these cars. So uh, another device, see here's, here's a donut, here's a little clamp, there's two donuts in a clamp, and uh, these are regular hose clamps here. Uh, but that's, this may not be every uh, SL you look at, but the point is, if you do any, if you change out the resonator section and or the muffler, make sure you, you just connect them, make sure they're loose enough, start the car, let it get good and hot, and then see where this ends up, and then tighten all your clamps. That way your exhaust, the entire exhaust system, front to back, is hanging in rubber. And you eliminate a lot of harshness in these cars. Differential, that's that big thing in the back. I recommend fluid changes 60 to, 60 to 90,000. And if you're gonna do it, always, always, always open the fill plug first. Now, why do we do that? Well, what if the uh, drain plug is stuck, or the drain plug is open, and you drain it and the fill plug is stuck? Now what do you do? How do you fill it? You want to make sure you can fill it. So open the fill plug first and then the drain plug. Of course it'll drain out a lot faster too. There's a vent on our, our on this gearbox, a differential. That's they breathe. If they get warm and cold, uh, they breathe and they pull in moisture and dust and dirt. And that's why you change the fluid every now and then. But uh, 
uh, most of our cars up except for limited slip take regular high port gear oil is what is it 85 90 uh, there's an MB, a mercedes benz part there for those who want to get the official stuff but uh, any good uh, i think it's 85 90 castrol or fluid run. limited limited slip and some light sls have uh, a different oil here's the part number for it get it from your dealer so um, Make sure you do put in the right fluid. If you have a manual gearbox, uh, uh, early ones use automatic transmission fluid or part number here from your dealer. Notice it's different from these. So, uh, but automatic transmission fluid in Mercedes Benz manual transmissions have been used for years. Another thing on uh, shift linkage, of course, the automatic is. is uh, to cover that, but if you have a manual transmission, the shift linkage bushings will be worn and a well used car, plan on new ones. This is the picture of the limited slip differential, and, and uh, this is the oil they want you to use, but uh, they're very expensive if they wear out, so you want to take good care of it. Software in our cars, rubber parts, I call them rubber, but you know, they're different kinds of plastic and rubber. Mission control tubing on a, on a 70s car is pretty well baked. Uh, just buy a meter or two of the correct size tubing and you can cut the pieces you need. Uh, fuel hoses, uh, lately, lately, heck, since 2006, E10 fuel eats away the older fuel hoses. And you can tell that they're eating away because they look wet, okay? So change out fuel hoses. And, uh, um, clamped hoses use a metric size hoses if you buy them. Same with your cooling hoses. Now, in my experience, cooling hoses last a long time on these cars if they're taken care of. But a rubber engineer from Gates showed me how to how to test a, uh, a uh, hose for its value. You pull, like let's say a big coolant hose on the engine. Take a dull knife and, and scrape the inside of the hose. If you can scrape off rubber on the inside of these hoses, it's time to change them. Uh, and I've, I've rarely seen a Mercedes Benz with the original hoses that bad. They do last a long time, but it's worthwhile looking at them uh, once in a while. Window seals and moldings, they'll get old on these cars. Um, but you said, you know, you've got to change them out. I think there's a question about a guy has rain coming in his SL to the uh, interface between the, the windshield header and the uh, convertible top or the hard top, I guess he said. And that's just that, that rubber seal across there is probably shot. Uh, hard top and soft top seals, make sure they, uh, they're good. If you have a hard top and, and you've got a winch to hold it up in the air, uh, try to devise a way, or maybe it, it came with the tools, to hang it without compressing the seals on the, on the, where the top of the windows go up. I see some of these, uh, the, the strap goes on and it compresses those seals for about six months and you put it down and then you get air air noise through that because that rubber hose has been compressed because it was, it was hanging off this strap so uh, if you can divide if you have a lift devise a, a method of, of holding it without compressing the rubber seals on the on the windows because that's, that's that's a source of a lot of wind noise and, and rubber water sometimes Never, ever, ever leave the soft top all folded up in the well. If you go, if you uh, are a snowbird back and forth from Arizona or Florida up north, you park your SL, don't put the top down. Put it up uh, uh, like it is. And uh, it'll keep the seals well. But uh, the... Uh, Long-term storage, there's two uh, traps moisture. That's not good for the top. And you get a lot of creases in, the, in your uh, windows. And you can't get the creases out or, or you can see them. So if you have a nice new top and you're going to store the car for any length of time, put the soft top up. And uh, put a, car, a cover on the car, too. The top rear latch cable. A lot of people have problems with that. I, uh, I've encountered it in a couple of cars. and. Uh, that's that's the one that you there's a little uh, chrome handle on the left side of the back deal and uh, it unlatches the top and of course that cable stretches or breaks 
you, know, you got to put a blanket over the hood and sit there with, with, uh, with a friend and try to push that latch to one side and get the hard top off or the soft top. So check that latch cable and then, and it's adjustable. And uh, if it looks bad, put it in, get a new one. Door, trunk, and taillight seals, uh, they all get old. And you may have a, a, a leaks in there. Air conditioning hoses. Believe it or not, on the SL all the way through, they're SAE hoses. They're not metric. They're SAE. You can have new hoses made up at a company that makes up new hoses. Uh, we have one here in Knoxville. I've taken it to them and took the old hoses here, make a new one. Boy, they had the right ends on it, everything. Uh, vacuum actuators all the way through the uh, door locks and climate control all have rubber uh, vacuum actuators with rubber uh, diaphragms in them. My company makes repair diaphragms for these, by the way, if you need them. Plastic, I call it plastic. It could be different kinds of plastic in our cars. But uh, keep it clean, use a preserve. Don't use armor all. Uh, use Pro 303 Protect it. Any uh, uh, boat, mar Marine store, I can't get that word out, will have 303 or you can get it through Amazon. That's the stuff to use on plastic. Leather, go to leathereek.com. They have a wonderful website with all this stuff on how to take care of your leather. If you, if you need to uh, uh, dye it back again, you know, if you got red seats and they're kind of pink, you can make them red again. They have all these procedures. And rather than going over them, I, to, I refer to their, their club members. They're good people. They're really helpful. So go there for, for your leather care stuff. But plastic and rubber, uh, like your seals and all that stuff, uh, 303 is wonderful. 303 was developed for the, uh, the big life rafts you see stacked, uh, uh, attached to the side of the Coast Guard cutters. They're out in the sun all the time. And that preserves those rubber uh, rafts. So that's what it was developed for. And of course, we've discovered that for our cars. So it's good stuff. Shield your car from excessive heat anytime you can. If you park several hours a day in the sun, buy a cover and just throw a cover over it. Only a few minutes to put it on, a few minutes to take it off. Uh, I really, you know, especially uh, a lot of these cars, you know, the dashes are cracking and uh, that's because the sun beats in them. So get, get a cover for it. Uh, in extreme cold, on the other hand, be careful with some of the controls. It'll break right off on you. So uh, that's something to, to uh, be aware of. Climate control. Boy, this, I get more questions on climate control on all these cars from 72 to 89 all the time. So uh, there's three general types. The first is the early one, 72 to 77. This is what it looks like. And it's a nice system. It really is. I, my uh, 80 to 80 SL had this system. I really like it. It's very versatile and everything else. But these lower uh, levers, they can get loose behind this panel. And things don't work so well. And they come loose or they can break. Uh, there are two vacuum actuators in here that open up for fresh air. I, I have those available. The AC control, that, uh, let's see which one it is. This one, that are no longer available anywhere. I have a, a bunch of the uh, <coughs> switches with the, with the capillary tube. And I can repair some of these, but uh, take good care of those. The air condition controls on these are hard to get. Me. The hot water valve, the water flow through here, is, this is a little valve that has a, an actuator. And uh, some of these are sealed and the early ones are still open. I have diaphragms to fit these. But this valve is operated by, if you raise either red lever up off its stop, it opens this valve. So either, either lever will give heat. And then the distribution of the heat is done by the other levers. So it's a nice, simple system. Everybody loved it. And then when it came out, automatic climate control, although everybody hated this. I don't blame them. It's a nice system. It's very versatile. It works well. You've got left and right controls, everything else. So it, it's really nice. Automatic climate control started in 78 to 81 cars. Um, has one of these servos. And that's a picture of mine, by the way. I, put, I make them with a human body. Uh, cycle it weekly. Run, run it to... Uh, or push the defrost button three minutes and the uh, auxiliary pump. Uh, oh, I didn't make that, fix that. Okay. Uh, what that does is cycle the servo because it's got the 
a little valve in there not more than a quarter inch wide that controls the coolant flow. It doesn't take a whole lot of crud to stop it and then this thing fails. <coughs> now, auxiliary water pump, it's right next to the servo. And uh, if yours is working, that's good. And uh, I recommend you pull the, the transmission dipstick, which is just a few inches away, and open the little white cap on top of the, the uh, blower, not the blower, the uh, little water pump. Now open, uh, remove the white cap and drip a, a drop or two of ATF on it. ATF is safe to use on electric motors. Don't use uh, uh, ordinary oil. ATF works just fine. Lower motor brushes uh, on these cars are going to be worn on uh, 150,000 miles. Uh, I have replacement motors for them. Uh, it's a job if you, you want to do it yourself. Real job. Get it right. But you can oil the bearings again with ATF if you want to. You need a squirt oiler to get down there to the bearing. Receiver dryer on air conditioning systems. If you have to open it up for any reason, you have to put in a new receiver dryer. That's that little tank out in front. If you squat down, look at the front of the car with the hood open, you'll see it to the right side of the radiator. And uh, it's a little black tank. It's got a little window in it. You can check the coolant uh, or the refrigerant flow. But uh, if you open your system anytime after five years, uh, buy, change on buying a new one, okay? Plastic servo, this is, this is the weak point of this system here. Uh, this part here is made of plastic. They last about two years and they crack. Right now, the dealers will sell you another plastic one for close to $2,000. You might earn a lot less money. So that's the big problem. And the actuator diaphragms under the dashboard, they have uh, rubber in them that's deteriorated. I have rubber to fix those. But those are the things you're going to see that are uh, ready to clean. And this is what the panel looks like here. If you have up to uh, from 78 to 81. SLs, including the 380 SL, four, four car had this for one year. So, uh, by the way, my company has all the parts for these, these systems. Later systems, 82 to 89. Uh, this is a picture of the panel removed from the panel, the controls. I didn't find a good picture inside. Anyway, auxiliary water pump, they have those through Lubum ATF also. Now, a seized water pump, if it's worn out and it's not working, It'll burn out this, this push button panel, and then you have to call me, okay? But uh, so make sure that water pump works. You can disconnect it and the jumper to battery. The brown wire is negative. By the way, on Mercedes Benz, brown wires are always negative, okay? But uh, if that pump fails, it'll take this out eventually. The mono valve, that's what this is a hot water valve uh, in these cars. And uh, this little silver dome in the middle here, that's actually about three inches long. Uh, if you have to change it, buy the Bosch insert. The Chinese are making a cheap thing that goes in there and it lasts about a month, maybe two months, and it binds up because the internal, there's a magnet inside. This is, there's a coil in here. That coil's energized, it closes the valve. It, it pulls a magnet inside this cylinder downward and it closes the valve. Well, in these cheap Chinese ones, that magnet and everything expands with heat and it jams and you can't turn off the heat or you can't get heat, one or the other, it's always work. Uh, again, vacuum actuator diaphragms aging. I have rubber to replace those. Blower motor brush wear is the same thing, oil the bearings. I have replacement Bosch motors. Don't buy the cheap Chinese motors that are coming out for the uh, 107s. They're smaller. I've got one, I looked at it, and it's smaller, so you go to put it in it, and it moves around. So you gotta wrap it in duct tape or something so it's tight, and they don't last very long. So just be aware of that. Um, but auto climate control in the, in the two versions that, that the SLs use, probably responds for most of the questions I get, and I'm always willing to help you out with that. Rust, chrome fender trim. Oh yeah, I see the SLs with that. I say, oh, take it off. Look how much rust you're gonna have underneath it. They can trap water and rust the, uh, the uh, fender trim, fender trim area, I'll put it that way. Rear care cargo area under the panels. If you, you, some, some SLs people have a little back seat there for the kids. Or lift up the panel and, and there's two, uh, uh, what do I call them, I guess. They look like dishes back there. And uh, they'll fill the water and they'll rust. Take your drill out and drill a hole through each one, left and right side. 
So those those uh, rear cargo or drains, if it ever gets water in, or you forget to put the top up and it rains on the car, and that water goes right in underneath that panel or a little seat if you have it. Uh, if you drill a hole like that, uh, then take a dab of, of primer, prime the hole so it uh, doesn't rust. But uh, they'll collect water there. I've, I've evaluated SLs and turned up, and they had three inches of water in the darn thing. And it's starting to rust pretty bad. Bottoms of the door, same thing. There are drains in these doors. Uh, you have to get down and look up, look up under the door um, and make sure the holes, the drains are uh, open. Uh, on a rainy day, you open the door, make sure you see water running out of the door. That means the water that got into the door is running out, okay? Now up front, there, well, I call them a frame rail, they're part of the unit body on this car. There's a drain hole in here. And almost every older SL I've seen, there's a lot of dirt in here. So that drain hole is plugged and this is full of water. Especially after you wash the car, there's water in there. So find that hole, uh, enlarge it a little bit, make a case quarter inch and uh, you know, prime it, in the bare metal in there. But uh, this is on the left and the right side, about even with the fan, okay, the front of the engine. You look down there, you'll see it, it's obvious. So uh, make sure you look at that. One other case here is I see this, why the wipers fail on the older cars or why they have problems. See these depressions here? When the car gets painted or isn't cared for, there are drain holes here. Drain hole here, drain hole here. Let those drain out. If they don't drain, these collect water. The water gets into the, the shaft, whoops, into the shaft here and uh, eventually gets get noise. Or worse yet, it binds it up so bad you destroy your motor or you destroy the linkage or something like that. So on your older SL, make sure those drains are available. And uh, another thing on these cars, I, I should have, uh, the, the air intakes here, left and right side, this is the right side, the left side over here. If you were to take this panel off and then look in there, you'd see baffles in there because, because the air comes in, comes in through here, it goes over the baffle and into the heater. But the outer end of that, that cavity goes down and, and if water gets in there and can't drain out of it, make sure when you put water in here, you see water draining out. If you don't see it draining out, try and get it clean. You take this panel off and squirt water down there and, and get that clean because if those rust, you might as well sell the car to a, a wrecking yard. You cannot fix them. You cannot fix the rust that occurs in those outer plenums. So, uh, be aware of that on the SL, it's really bad. Now, I'm gonna read, I gotta leave for just two seconds and I'll be right back and uh, Gary can uh, take some questions. I'll be right there. Okay, that was wonderful, George. And I've got a whole bunch of questions, uh, several that were submitted in advance. George did also, did already answer the question about the water coming in through the, uh, windshield, which is something I've seen in a 107 as well. And his answer was that it's the rubber seal on either the hard top or the soft top. And, uh, and so what we'll do is I'll go through the pre-submitted questions and then I'm gonna go through the questions in chat, kind of in order that we ask them. Once we get through that, I'll probably just go to a uh, raising hands for questions. And, and George likes to answer questions. So uh, we will sit here until all your questions are answered. There were some questions also about what George's correct email address is, and you'll see it on this slide. And uh, I've, I have found through my association with him that he is very quick and very good in answering these questions. And he'll usually provide you with a manual reference uh, or a copy of the page in the manual or something like that. So he's, he's quite a wonderful resource for our club. And, uh, while we wait, let me uh, mention, I'm gonna do a little commercial about our events at the end. I'm gonna go do a little bit of that commercial right now as we're waiting for George. Uh, we're still doing uh, virtual events. We're not having an in-person event until the 28th of June. Our next visual uh, video teleconference event is June 20th and we entitled it Photographing Cars. It's actually gonna be a seminar on how to do good photographs. And it is a video teleconference event. And you can join up on that one using motorsport registration. Well, I see George is back. So let's transition over to asking questions. <laughs> <Fight>. <laughs> and 
And uh, I think I'll go through the ones that we got in advance first, and then we'll just move through the chat questions, if that's okay with you. That's fine, however you want to do it. Okay. Uh, we, we got one from Jim Mitchell. He says 87 SL with 778, 77,000 miles, uh, has an issue uh, in cold start. It runs roughly for about five or 10 seconds and it smooths out and runs as it should. And he said he's tried fuel system cleaners, new plugs, new air filters without su success. Is there a sensor that has failed or what? He'd appreciate any input. Could be a sensor. I was starting to put together an answer to him on email. And uh, I, I just hadn't finished it yet. But what it is, is uh, it might be the uh, uh, relay. It's not the uh, cold start relay isn't working well. Could be a sensor. There's some tests. I'll, I'll send him some checks he can do before he throws a lot, any more money in the wrong place. But uh, that, that system, that cold start, is uh, it's not working well and it's controlled by a relay. That may be bad. Or a sensor. So, but I'll, I have his, I'm constructing his answer. It's on my computer. I just haven't sent it yet. Okay. Well, here's another one that you probably already are working on. Uh, it's from Stephen Nisnik. And he says, Is it possible for one to rebuild, refurbish the climate controlled vacuum system control on a 79450 SL? And that's right down your line. Absolutely. I have everything you need with that system right. Rubber parts, uh, servo if you need it, the pump, amplifier, all that stuff, and all kinds of literature to help you out. So, uh, by the way, speaking of literature, I do recommend those who like to work on your own car. I do have available the uh, CD of all the factory manuals on a CD. Uh, contact me if you'd like one. And I, 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 did you get yours, Gary? Oh, I got it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. You were very quick to send that. I appreciate okay, it. Good. Yeah, I have those available. So, uh, I think Mercedes Benz probably gave, gave up trying to get after me for copyright <laughs> violations <laughs> because it, they're all over the place. Okay. Uh, we have uh, basically this question twice one from John Trutman and um, one other from uh, um, Dennis Hoffman. And it's uh, I have 560 SL, one of and one of them is a 79 450 SL. My number one problem right now is hard starting. And you've answered one of these, but I uh, think thought you might want to go over this one again. This is the one where um, the he has hard cold starting, and it began immediately after installing all new injectors, associated air hoses, old tube, oiler tube holders, spark plugs, timing chain guides, and new valve cover gaskets. Uh, the cars that 80,000 miles, but he has a hard, had a hard start issue when the car is hot. And I know you, you uh, answered this one. The, I'll go over it for everybody else if you want me to. Uh, hard, hot start is, is uh, especially with E10 fuel, which I hate. Uh, it boils off, turns the vapor at lower temperature than real gasoline. Now, in, in our SLs, there's a check valve in the nose of the fuel pump. So when you turn the car off, it maintains the pressure from the pump all the way up to the fuel distributor. If that check valve leaks, the, the pressure drops. And uh, it's, of course, a hot engine. So the fuel in the lines boils off to vapor. So you got to crank and crank and crank and you know, until the pump finally gets fresh liquid fuel up to the fuel distributor and the car starts. So the solution is, uh, uh, well, you can go about it measuring if you want to, if you have the stuff. I have a, a fuel system measuring device, but uh, just buy at least a check valve, or if the pump is 150,000 miles, that was an 80,000 mile car, probably got a good pump on it. I would put just the check valve in and, and see if that works. There's two devices back there with the, with the fuel pump. There's that check valve right in the nose of the fuel pump. There's also another device there, kind of funny looking, uh, I don't know, it's about three inches diameter. That's the accumulator. That maintains pressure in the system also. Right. So just to be safe, you're going to take the whole mess out of the car, change the accumulator, put a new check valve in, and check your hoses and everything else. 80,000 mile car shouldn't be doing that, but check valve probably, uh, the check valve is about 50 bucks at most. 
with with shipping. So that's 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 why I have hard hot starting because uh, these new fuels boil off so easy on, after a hot engine. And uh, if the check valve is leaking, the pressure goes away and then it's hard to start it again. And Dennis Hoffman has essentially the same question about a 1979 with 53,000 miles. Would that be the same answer for him? Yeah, hot. This E10 fuel we were forced to use by the government, or if we can't find real gas, but I don't know where to get it. Uh, it's raising hob with these old cars. They weren't designed for it. It eats away the fuel hoses. It uh, it gives you these kind of problems. Uh, depending on the state you live in, if you know where you buy real gasoline, uh, use that if you possibly can. I, I here in Oak Ridge we have three stations. We have we have Sunoco 93 octane. Love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Real gas. <laughs> Just yeah. miles from my house. But uh, yeah. there's a, a website called Pure gas, one word, pure gas, not org, org. Go there, select your state, and in this state, it'll tell you who has real gas, you know, regular and uh, uh, premium and everything else. Try to use that if you can. You can use that sales. They'll run better, and uh, you won't have quite as many problems. You get better gas miles. My wife's a Prius, but if you have to use E10 in it, it gets 10% less mileage. And uh, I found that in my Mercedes Benz, the same thing. The E10 fuel is just rotten stuff. So, next question. Okay, uh, this was from Carl Stendahl, and I know you emailed an answer to this and mentioned it in the brief, but I think it's probably worth going over. He says he has a 1980 450 SL that has a vibration in the rear of the car when accelerating with the engine between 1600 and 2000 RPM, and he's changed the uh, uh, differential mounts, transmission mounts, rear shocks, brake rotors, and axles, um, and uh, that's really kind of the question, the vibration. Well, I didn't mention it, but uh, that kind of a vibration, I would have changed the transmission mount. Maybe did that. How about yeah, the flex that. disc, the center bearing support? That's that's usually the culprit, and the rear flex disc. Those are three items in that drive shaft that. Uh, can cause those kind of vibrations. Might check the motor mounts up front too. Anything in the drivetrain, motor mounts, transmission mount, uh, the center bearing, flex discs, uh, can cause that kind of vibration. I know he replaced a lot of stuff, you know, but they missed, he didn't mention the stuff I'm mentioning. So that's what you want to look at. Okay, from Bill Bernays, and this one's right down your AC line. It's an 88 560 SL, 62,000 miles. Um, and I know you sent him a note on this, but this is worth it for the other folks. It says, sometimes for no apparent reason, his AC fan stops blowing. If I turn it off and wait for a little while, but no definite time frame, then turn it back on, most times it will restart or sometimes not for a little longer. Any help would be welcome. Did he mean the blower fan? Blower yes. in the car? Yeah, I think he's talking about the AC interior fan. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to remember what, what I told him on that. Um, it could, there's a fan control box behind the glove compartment. It's possible that. It's possible it could be the push button panel. Um, I, we'd have to do a bit more testing. We got which device is failing because the power for that pump and, and or the pump for that blower. Uh, there are multiple speeds in it and everything else. Um, probably wouldn't hurt to get into it and make sure the, ends, the motor clean the brushes or just, just spray uh, contact cleaner on the brushes just to make sure they're not, not, not full of crud or something. I don't know, but that's a young car. It was an 80, no, 86? 88. 88, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a fairly young car, low mileage. Should be that, but uh, the controls, are, are heat intermittent and it's just control box or the push button panel could be at fault and I'll have to do a bit more fooling. I have those parts available if you, if you want some. And for club members, I'm always willing to trial, send them a trial part, see if that solves the problem. If it doesn't, send it back, you know, we'll go the next step. But for mm -hmm. club members, I, I have some devices, some parts I'm glad to let you use it as a trial. Yeah, I know you also sent him a, the uh, wiring diagram at that circuit, which was pretty complex. 
yeah but, uh, <laughs> it is <laughs> it's got to, it's got all the, the speed controls on it it's, it's something else <laughs> Okay, we had two questions from Bob Steffen, one of which you answered already with a pretty long uh, technical uh, exchange with him. The second one, though, um, kickdown function on his 450 SL stopped working. He said the kickdown switch is working, shows continuity when activated. He's got 12 volts at the switch when the key's turned on. Uh, he's concerned about the box on the right side of the transmission, which he thinks is the kickdown solenoid. And uh, he says he's not seeing that in the parts supplier's uh, information. And I know you asked him for his VIN, and he, uh, he mentioned this morning he's still got to get down there and uh, you know, look at the transmission number. But did you want to say something about the, the kickdown? Yeah, the reason I asked you for the transmission number is, is different ones for different numbers, different solenoids. Now, uh, he can test the solenoid, pull it out, and you know, it's got wires going to it. Somewhere where it connects is. Uh, see if it uh it clicks you know when it, when it operates but uh if he if he needs a new one i need the number off the transmission to get it because when i go into the mercedes-benz parts catalog it says up to transmission number so and so that after him. <laughs> so i don't know which one he would need but i could probably get it for him if it's bad but if he wants to pull it off and uh, and check it see if it works when it uh, um, get power to it fine go from there but that's why i asked him for that number on the transmission and, and uh okay and i've got one more this is one that was sent by email this morning and it says uh, it's from jim martin the 88560 sl he says sometimes the governor cuts out then regages for no apparent reason acts like a short is it electrically or vacuum run and where should i start looking i suspect he's probably talking about the cruise control I would imagine that's the only quote governor on the car. Uh, we can fix that. You've got a, a control module that's intermittent. Um, it's getting old, believe it or not. Uh, it's an 88, but it's in years. Because we're talking about capacitors and, and solid state devices inside that that, that kind of age uh, in operation. So if it's, if it's intermittent like that, uh, we have replacement rebuilt replacements for a reasonable price available for them. But that's, that's what it is, is a control box. It's not a vacuum. It's electro electromechanical uh, cruise control. If you look on the top of the engine, there's a little box with an arm and a linkage. It goes to the throttle linkage. That's the motor that operates the uh, cruise control. If he wants to, he can unplug the, the wire, the cable from that motor on the engine, clean the contacts, plug it in again. Maybe that'll solve it. Now, let's do that first. That's, that's cheap. Uh, just spray contact cleaner on the, I think there's five pins, it doesn't matter, but it's, it's a little connector and the cable goes to the motor, the cruise control motor right on top of the engine. You can't miss it. But, uh, and, and I think that connector is over on the left fender well, uh, fender apron, I'll call it. And uh, clean those contacts and see if it goes away. If it does, no, uh, no foul. <laughs> but otherwise, we have the amplifiers for us. I'm going to shift over to the chat questions, uh, and I'm kind of going in order that they were uh, submitted. A 83500SL, one of the ABS sensors stopped working. Any idea where to get a replacement? Well, let's not replace it yet. Um, here's how I uh, restore ABS systems. Jack up the front of the car so the wheels can turn. Put a lot of newspaper under the wheel. Take the ABS sensor out of the, the steering knuckle in the back there. Uh, I think it's held by one bolt. Take it out, spin the wheel, and spray uh, disc brake cleaner in that hole. And watch all the black crud that comes out of there, drips on your newspaper. I hope you put, I hope you put down, okay? It's a mess. Uh, and keep rotating until it's clean. What's happening is you're getting brake dust into that uh, uh, the hub. If, it, if you look at the hub, it's got a bunch of teeth. It looks like a gear. And that sensor looks at those. And when they get full of, uh, of uh, brake dust and debris, the sensor's a little foul. And, and you, get, uh, you might even get an EBS uh, alarm on the panel. Do both front wheels that way. Clean them. There's also the connector from the sensor comes off the steering knuckle up in the engine compartment there. There's a connector, it's a big connector. Just disconnect it. And, Maybe spray some stuff on it. Connect it again. Do both left and right side. See if that solves your problem. Uh, 
I've, I've recovered ABS systems several times that way. That dirt in that, in that uh, hub wheel it can, can cause all kinds of problems. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got, uh, let's see, in the email, what tire size, what is the largest tire size that can be installed on a 79 450 SL? Well, you mean they came with what, 15s? You can probably you can put a 16 on it if you get a lower uh, section height. So I think they're stocked with, no, I'm trying to remember, the tire. I would say you can go to a 16 and, and go to a lower section height tire. So uh, long as it doesn't rub on the fender. The only thing, is, if you're changing wheels, make sure that the offset, which on the back of a, any Mercedes-Benz wheel is, is the numbers following the letters ET. ET, call home. ET, and then there'll be a number like 35. I, I, going from memory here, I don't know what, what the SL would be. Let's say it's a 35. If you want to put a different wheel on, make sure the ET is, is plus or minus five millimeters from that. That's millimeters, what that is. That's the offset of the wheel. If you get a car that's offset like uh oh you see people around like hondas with the wheels way out that's really extreme but you know if the offset's too far in or too far out too far in it's going to rub on the on the caliper if it's too far out it puts a lot of stress on the front bearing and your, your handling is affected so first thing is make sure the wheel uh you, you put the uh the et uh, the offset is within five millimeters of the stock and uh Again, if you're going to go with a 16 inch wheel, um, you probably get a drop down to a 40 height. Because I think the stock they came with about a 75, 65, I can't remember. But wh whatever. Uh, have them send me an email and I'll look up the tire charts and uh, we'll go from there. It'll be the easiest thing. I just have them. Okay. Found in front Dennis, of you heard that. So. You can get, you can get, you can't put larger wheels and tires, but you want to keep your overall diameter the same. They're close to the same. That's why you get a lower section height tire. Right. And, uh, so your speedometer will be right and everything else. Right. It's a 14 in it now. So I was it's thinking about going now. to a 15, yes. Yeah, you can go to 15. 15, okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, shifting back to the chat. I know the answer to this one because I just ordered a Pertronics unit from George. Is it worthwhile to enjoy? To install a Pertronics ignition system in an 81 380 SL? No, the 81 has electronic ignition. The Mercedes Benz electronic ignition. Very reliable. The Pertronics replaces the points that were in up to 74, I think. So after that, they went to electronic, much better system. Don't even think about changing out the, uh, because, well, <laughs> I think you're going to mess up a lot of things if you pull out the electronic system out of say an 81 yeah okay there's a question on the values for euro spec r107s and c107s and i have no clue but maybe you do well it depends on who your market is who you want who, who wants them i love them because i i had an 80 280 sl model and it had the euro headlights you had the wipers for the headlights <laughs> And the, the twin cam six at 195 horse or something like that. It had more horsepower than the same year V8, the 80 uh, 450s. Uh, it was several hundred pounds lighter because it had the short bumpers and aluminum hood and deck lid. So uh, uh, I did pretty well in our time trials and autocross with that. So uh, they're nice cars, and there's certain people like those night cars, but. Uh, being a, a gray market, shall we call it, a European model, the parts are the same throughout the car except in certain areas, that's all. And I can get you the parts if you call me or I can tell you who has the parts or I can get them. There's no big difference. Uh, I, I think they're better looking and, and I like the six cylinder better. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a more narrow market if you go to sell one. You see them on Bring a Trailer periodically, and the European ones tend to bring about fifteen thousand dollars or more higher than the equivalent U.S. car. A good one, yeah, because people sometimes they'll have a five-speed transmission, manual transmission yeah. too, and a lot of people like that. So, uh, yeah, there is a market, but uh, through the general market, you know, uh, it's hard to find. But Bring a Trailer places like that, you can get an idea of the value. 
and they have some nice ones that sound like anyway. But uh, well, here's here's one. Uh, having recently spent a boatload of dollars on a new climate control servo and amplifier from my 1980 SL that only lasted one week, I would like to know what your thoughts are, if any, on the aftermarket digital replacements. Not preservation class material, but how do these compare with the OEM for reliability? The OEM can be made reliable. I don't know where he got the servo and where he got the parts that he would replace for a boatload of money. But uh, yeah, there is a company in Phoenix or, you know, that is making a replacement for it. And uh, it's $700. And if you ever go to sell a car, you've got to tell a story. And uh, oh, don't it. It, uh, nobody knows how they work. Oh, shut up. <laughs> nobody knows how that system works. If you take it into a shop, they're going to scratch their head. They've never seen it. It's only uh, guaranteed for 30 days. If you go to a dealer, so forget it. That's all those people calling in now that you've uh, mentioned yeah. how it will be. Uh, it'll be done. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how they work. I know uh, several people have ordered a servo from me to replace that system because they didn't like the way it worked. It didn't, it wasn't automatic. Like it, it wouldn't compensate for changes in temperature in the car or outside the car. Now, as far as what he spent, uh, tell him to email me, tell me what he did, where he got the parts, uh, what, what he, uh, what he parts. I can make that system work exactly like it did when it was new. And at one point of reliability, the aluminum housing replaces the plastic housing, which will always crack. I have a, Two bins full of crack, uh, crack servos. Those are cores I get back when I sell my aluminum ones. We eliminate that one problem. Any other problems that occur, I can take care of them for you uh, with technical help or whatever. So uh, come contact me. We'll we'll get it right. Okay. Um, next one is a uh, odometer and 86560SL has failed. No replacements available from Mercedes Benz worldwide. Leads would be appreciated. Now, pull it out and take it and send it to, uh, uh, what's the guy down in Texas? Oh. Which one's that? World. Zepco Speedometer Zep Repair? Zepco. Yeah, it's Zepco yeah. in Richardson, Texas. They fixed mine and it works great. Yeah. Uh, the only problem is, what year was the car? That was a 86. Okay. Now, I have to pull the steering wheel to get the instrument cluster out and then take the speedometer out and send it down to this guy and they'll fix it for a very reasonable fee. That is a common problem with, with uh, the uh, speedometers. My 71, my, yeah, my 71, 250 did it. I had a couple other cars, all do it, the, the odometer. What happens is, is there's a shaft that runs through all those little numbers in there. And, but the shaft is, is keyed to the zero or the tenths of a mile. So it, it, it rotates, but every time it goes around, it kicks the next one down to the left and, and so on. Well, that it, it loses its grip on the shaft. So the shaft turns and the wheel doesn't. So your odometer quit working. And that's what it is. But uh, the best guy in the business is, uh, is a email me or I'll get his name for you. But he can, he can repair it and uh, get it working. Yeah, Brett answered that one in chat. So you so look at the chat for that name. Yeah. Okay. Um, Eighty-eight five sixty SL, very original, thirty-seven thousand miles. Starts quickly, but very loud knocking for two seconds. Also cuts out on hard acceleration. Hmm. Very loud knocking. You have to listen to it. I don't know. Uh, Low mileage, I mean, the engine should be okay. I don't know what kind of history it has. Um, might look at the, the engine shock absorbers. Maybe the bushings are worn out and the engine engine rocks a little bit and makes a knocking noise. I've seen that. Uh, but he, he really needs to listen. Is, is, it, is it inside the engine or is it something external? Like the shock absorbers or motor mount loose or deteriorated. That's an awfully young car to have that. That's, that's what surprises me. Those things generally go, but if it's the engine, you got to do a bit more uh, search with a 
you know, a competent mechanic and take a look and see if you've got a stuck valve. Um, I don't know. There's something. There's something in there. If it's inside the engine, it's going to take a, a, a bit more diagnostic to figure that out. Okay. I hate it when that happens. Yeah. From uh, Nick Yuransky, he says he has a one inch piece of wood trim missing from the dash of his 88560SL. Any thoughts on where he can obtain replacement trim? Uh, if Mercedes Benz has it, it'd be expensive. <laughs> but the outfit in California, uh, Madeira's, Madeira Co Concepts, they can make up a new one for him, match it pretty well. That's, that's the best solution you can do. It's missing, golly. Yeah. Somebody's rough on that car. Yeah. Of course, there's always eBay. But, uh, yeah, you can always look at eBay. Yeah, just be careful. <laughs> okay, here's here's one that actually was answered in chat. But it'll be you'll have fun with it. Um, why are the 107, R107, and R129 cars R's instead of W like the other chassis numbers? R, I think R is for what Roadster. Roadster, yeah. W is Wagen, W A G E N, German word for car, I think. Yeah, and the coupes are C. C-107s. Yeah. yeah, so I think it means Roadster, R-107. I think that's what it was. I never saw a definitive thing on it, but that's my guess. Going at W for the passenger cars is Wagen in German, so. <laughs> and one of the questions is, can we get a copy of these slides? Yes, uh, Diana makes up this whole thing, as I understand. She did the last one, right? Yeah, yeah. No. If you'll send them. If you'll send them to me, then I'll I'll post them in a place where people. Yeah, can. I'll post them and get it all. And, yeah. and uh, again, I'm available for questions or comments or emails or phone calls on any of these subjects on the SLs. I'm always available. Okay, John. John Wonick asks about a replacement heater valve, the control that switches from heat to AC. He didn't say which year, but I know that's something that you've got a lot of expertise in. Yeah, I need to know the year because there's uh, three different uh, valves. <laughs> the early ones is pretty simple. Then there's the, the climate control servo, and then there's the the uh, cars with the mono valve in it from '82 on. So I I don't know what which year we're talking about. Switching from air conditioning, from heating to air conditioning. Uh, I don't know. It, it's it's an '83. '83. Okay, that's the late system. Later, I call it. And if it doesn't switch, well, I need to know uh, when you push the middle button, that's the one you use all the time, okay? That's normal. And select, say, you want 75 degrees in the car. It should uh, start out blowing cold air and then eventually moderate, you know, until as the car warms up or cool, you know, cools down. And uh, now, something to be aware of on uh, the SLs, Look on the dashboard. I, did, I didn't get the slide on this. Look on the dashboard. There's a little air intake about one inch square. Middle of the, uh, um, starting in 80, no, even earlier, 116s and everything. Okay, so let, let's look at the, uh, that little air intake in the middle of the dashboard, right? And that air intake has a sensor. If you could look down in there, you'd see a little sensor in there. It's a thermistor. That sensor sits in a plastic housing that has a pipe uh, pointing to the right, and that's connected by a piece of foam rubber, foam hose. Looks like pipe insulation, gray stuff. Or it was, no, it was white in, in originally, but it's all disintegrated in every uh, SL I've been into. Uh, get a piece of that hose from D Home Depot. You might pay a dollar for six feet of this stuff, but you only need about eight or nine inches. And restore that path between that sensor housing and the other end of it goes to a pipe behind the glove compartment. So you have to get your hands back up in there and and uh, you know, plug it in there. It's, it's easy to do. I've done dozens of them. As a matter of fact, people that buy a server, when we get a free one, just a, and an explanation why you want it. And if anybody here needs needs that, so, uh, I can send them uh, the uh, how to do it. And just go go buy your uh, hose at Home Depot. A half inch ID is all it is. But uh, that reestablishes the flow path because when your blower is running, that sucks air in through that little drill. And that air, of course, influences the sensor, and that that uh, tells the system whether you know add heat or cold.
cooling, whatever way you want it. So that's important to have that airflow into that sensor. Or some people put a dash cover on, they cover up the whole thing, and that, and they wonder whether their climate control doesn't work right. So that's keep that in mind. If you put a dash cover on your SL, make a hole for that little sensor and uh, make sure that's there so air flows into it. You can test it when the blower's running. Take a match and uh, extinguish it or a candle. You know, as long as you generate a little bit of smoke, the smoke should be sucked down into that. That means it's properly operating. That's a, that's a good test. And if it's not, plan on pulling the glove compartment, get a piece of that foam hose and reestablish that flow path in there. Easy to do. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Thank you, Mark asked about kick down cable replacement. Kick down cable? Yes. You mean the mechanical cable on the throttle linkage? Um, well, let's ask Mark. Mark, are you with us? Or you mean the electrical wire cable? <laughs> Mark, Mark unmute yourself. You're, you're talking. I see your mouth moving. Where is he? I don't see him here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a I have a, a Euro car with a okay. three-speed automatic, and it's got a it looks to be a mechanical cable linkage that got frozen, and it caused uh, the throttle pedal to stick. So okay. I removed it, and I got a replacement from the dealer, but I haven't done anything to it yet. Um, I just have it off. Um, just not sure what I'm dealing with once I get past the mechanical end of it to the transmission side, which will be the driver's side. I think I saw that procedure in the uh, shop manual. So send me an email and I'll, I'll pull it up for you and send it to you. That okay. cable, uh, uh, yeah, there's a certain length it's got to be and you know, all that's got to be right. If uh, I leave it off, does it make much difference? Yeah, there's another cable that uh, maybe we're talking about the same thing. I'm not sure. It goes from the throttle linkage down to this to the transmission, and uh, that's the one. Okay. Uh, the cable. That one. What what uh, what car is it? It's a uh, it's a Euro. It's a eighty one three eighty SLC. Three eighty SL was only an American car. That's funny. They were never sold in Germany. Well, my, I have. The Euro That's okay. Version. It's the it's same as the American Creative <laughs> It's right behind me. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I made it a rally car. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, just send me the VIN. I'll make sure I get you the right procedure. For they, only made a thousand of, they only made a thousand of the 380s, from what I understand, the Euro. Because oh, my bin good number me, yeah. says number 11. Oh, my God. Because so, I had them. One of the reps from Mercedes told me that it was only made for the U.S. market. I think what he meant is it had emission controls to meet the U.S. market. Yeah, mine doesn't have it's any. Mine. Have them, right. Well, that'd be nothing. A, nothing. Car, <laughs> it's, got a, it's got a manual transmission? It's got a three-speed automatic like the rally cars did back okay. in the day, the BP one. So okay. that's why I made it a, a replica of the of the 1980 Bama rally car. Okay. Right down to the the decals. Okay, send me the VIN and uh, I'll get the procedure for you. Well, question, if you leave it if you leave it off in general, make any difference? You won't have any, when you push the gas pedal down, it won't drop, it won't drop down the gear. Do it manually on the, with the, with the shifter lever, right? <laughs> yeah, you can shift it manually, yeah. You'll just lose, lose your kick down, shall we say, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm an old guy. I drive it slow. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell uh, him. I'll send you that. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll be glad to help you out. <laughs> All righty. Bye now. Well, the, the next question in chat is also from Mark. He said, fuel injectors leaking hard start when cold. We've already kind of been in that direction. So. Well, cold hard start, again, I would check yeah. the fuel pump check valve. I said that wrong. It's hard start. Hard start when hot. When hot. Hot. Yes. Or cold. If it's cold, the same, same car. <laughs> fuel system's losing pressure. You have to crank it a while before it starts? Uh, it actually, when it's hot, it, 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 uh, it won't. I cranks it and cranks it, nothing happens. 
Yeah. You let it sit for a minute or two, it'll fire up again. Yeah. I've done the accumulator, fuel pump, fuel filter, uh, clean the injectors, uh, all new ex uh, ignition system. No. I did not do anything with that check valve. Okay, try that first. There, uh, in the fuel distributor, there is another check valve. And it's generally, uh, I think it's a brass colored nut on the side of the distributor. You take it, take it loose. I've got this in the book. Uh, and there's a little spring in there and some stuff. If you get crud in there, that will let the pressure drop off too. The pressure, when you turn the car up, is held between the fuel pump check valve and that valve in the you mean the, the little, uh, di you mean the little plunger and the dizzy, right? No, it's not really a plunger. This comes in from the side, side of the fuel distributor. Okay. And, and there's a nut, and you take that loose. Uh, mention it in your email, and I'll I'll get you this thing on it. Okay? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to know more about because this car is totally different than my other Euros. I have the 280s with the five speeds as well. Love them. Faster than the 380s, <laughs> for sure. What year is a 280? I have a I have an 83 and an 84, both from Phoenix, both dry as a bone, both with the five speeds. Yeah. And they're all under 100,000 miles. Love them to death. The Euro Euros cars? Are, Euro car, complete Euro cars. That's what with I, my black. eight was a Euro and it had more power than the 450. And uh, absolutely, uh, I, and it's lighter too. Yeah, <laughs> little hundred pounds lighter, not those, bump, those big old bumpers, that's right. Uh, the Pitts, I'm from the I'm on the board at the Pittsburgh section of the uh, Mercedes Benz of a uh, club, and right. we appreciate this. Uh, we have a we have a event every year called the Vintage Grand Prix. I don't know if okay. any of you right. guys have ever come out to it. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, this year due to the pandemic, we had to cancel it. Um, but we're hoping next year when we invite all groups from all yeah. different sections to come to an event yeah. that. Uh, out in our Pittsburgh land. Very Thank good. You again. Alrighty. Anytime. I wasn't. I wasn't promoting. Uh, I wasn't promoting anything other than a charity. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, we had Jack Pelton asks us, where can I get a replacement power antenna for my 1981 380 SL? I have a rel relatively Hirschman, relatively inexpensive one uh, for eighty nine dollars. Uh, and it, uh, does the SL have an intermediate trend? Uh, can you adjust the, the length of it? If you can, oh, you can, okay. That's the, the uh, original equipment you can adjust it. It's got a, a, a antenna switch that you can adjust it. Now the one I have, it just goes up or goes down unless you turn the antenna off. But it, uh, those adjustable ones from the factory, they're very expensive. Uh, Becker Auto Sound has rebuilt units. Go go to their website, Becker Auto Sound, all one word, dot com. He's a club member. They're good people there, and you can look on there and see what if you want the original equipment type. If you want the ones I've got here, if they're eighty nine dollars, easy to put in. I put in lots of them because that adjustable feature nobody uses it anyway. Either all the way up or all the way down. So this is from Steve. Uh, he says, for all of us who won't put 30,000 miles on our car in a decade or more, how often should fluids be changed time-wise? Well, I'd use engine oil uh, before you store it in, in winter so the engine doesn't sit with used oil in it, okay? That's engine oil and filter. Uh, otherwise, the transmission, 30,000 miles, the intervals I gave in the thing here are fine as far as fluids go so uh, but it's just the engine uh, you want to change it after you I assuming you're, you're driving the car or, you know in the summer in nice weather and then you park it for most of the bad weather so uh, you know then change oil before you store it if you're going to store the car but otherwise you can drive it periodically but not very far uh, at least have, drive it so the engine's thoroughly warmed up each time you take it out winter or summer uh, if you're not storing it but uh, if you're going to store it for several months, change oil and filter before you put it on. Okay, this is from Roy Kahnmeiser. Says his AC becomes warm when he's accelerating or going uphill. What should he check? 
Which car? Roy, which, which car is that? It's an 87 450. I sent the second email with that information in it. Okay, okay I'll get on it. Uh, usually what's happening is when you go up a hill, your engine vacuum drops and there are vacuum actuated switches that will drop out and uh, it's, it's cutting out the compressor maybe. But do check and make sure your Freon in the compressor system is full uh, also. But uh, yeah, there are uh, lower vacuum, the, the switches, uh, there's a switch that'll drop out, cut out the compressor. So that may be your problem. You're but, suggesting there's vacuum leaks? Uh, maybe a bad switch or maybe possibly uh, uh, the engine, the gasoline engines put out pretty good uh, vacuum. So the leaks can occur, in, you know, you open the hood and look on the left or driver's side, there's a network of rubber hoses there. Maybe when I'm loose or, or if they easily pull off the little check valves, just kind of practically fall off, snip off about a quarter inch and replug it on there. You know, or right. change out thing. You know, they can they get brittle with age, and then they start to leak where they connect to something else. And uh, like I say, if you got the length of it, you can cut off a little bit of, of the brittle end and then plug it into fresh rubber, so to speak. It might be tighter. So you might check all those and then see if that makes a difference. Because what what kind of uh, coolant is in the refrigerants in the four fifty seventy seven? Is that well, one? The R twelve. Unless it's been changed, it's still R12. It's 12, yeah. A little you trouble. get good substitutes for it, though. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next question is also on uh, AC, and it was, I lost my place here. AC, this is from Brandon Fried. He says, AC in his 87.560 SL has a leak. And the mechanic is recommending replacing the system. How much should it cost? I also point out uh, Brett Jurek uh, put a chat a few minutes later. It says I just converted my AC to the new refrigerator and it cost just under fourteen hundred dollars. Oh my God! <laughs> Jeez. All right. Uh, first of all, it's got a leak. Replacing the whole system. What does that mean? Uh, we need a little bit more uh, specific leak checking. Uh, what you do is. Uh, Go to a place that has a sniffer that sniffs out the refrigerant gas. Of course, make sure the system's full of gas, all right? Turn on the defrosters and sniff the defroster vents at the base of the windshield. If it detects Freon in that airflow, that means your evaporator is leaking. Big job, expensive job, okay? But if that's not there, then go elsewhere with the dye to look for hoses that are leaking. R134 has a smaller molecule. It leaks out all the time. You might have to just change hoses. So uh, use a dye check and see if any, any fittings on the hoses are leaking underneath the, uh, under the dash or un in the engine compartment. But uh, the guy who told you to replace the whole system, I don't know, what does he mean? Condenser, evaporator, everything, compressor, hoses, controls, what? So let's just be a bit more uh, specific on the on the leak detection, figure out where it is before we spend a lot of money on it. Okay, the uh, Bill Ellis asked, he says the emergency brake releases but the light stays on, how should he correct that? There's a little switch under there, maybe it's broken or out of, or loose. So you love to stand on your head and look at the dashboard. <laughs> but there's, it's a, excuse me, a pretty simple arrangement in there. You just got uh, from the pedal, the, I think the switch is on the pedal really. So take a look at the wire, maybe it fell off, I don't know, whatever. If it's on all the time, uh, but just get in there and inspect it. There, there's a switch there. It may be broken, you can get the switch or contact me. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's where that comes from, is just a switch on the pedal mechanism. Okay. Uh, net this is Ned Bob, and he says, what parts of the car should be treated with the 303 protectorant? Are we talking about the door and the window seals or the dash or what? Anything but leather, okay? For leather, use a correct preservative uh, that Leather Eek has or others. But uh, 303 is good for plastics and uh, rubber or anything else. 
Okay. So, uh, Rich Martin, and this is a question you've gotten pretty close to already. Um, my 107 is hard to restart when the engine is warm. I've heard this could be a leaking fuel injector or a fuel distributor. How do I troubleshoot? Well, the, the uh, more, more definitive way is to put a, a pressure gauge on the fuel system and see. But I'm always suspicious of the thing that, uh, that always causes that check valve in the fuel pump. So I would just put a new one if he hasn't already. And of course, at the other end, you can check the fuel distributor and see if it's if it's there. But uh, injectors, uh, I don't know. I, I, a lot of people have changed them out and never solved the problem. That tells me the injector is not the problem in those cases. So I would I would look at the, the check valve accumulator in that area. I'll start with that. Thank you. Uh, Gary Semelik asks, uh, any reference for clock repair? And I have that issue myself. I need to replace, fix my clock. Uh, <laughs> there's a professor at Georgia Tech that uh, can fix them. I don't know if he will. Send me an email and I'll get you. A, a world Speedometer, I think, can check clocks too. You might call and ask them. But, uh, what year clock is it? Or, or the car? Gary, what's your clock is yours? I hope he's still with us. You do have to unmute, by the way. I do have some information on clocks that I could send. There, there's a certain year's clocks. All you do is uh, you, you buy two capacitors from Radio Shack or whoever has them and replace them and they work fine. Right, the capacitors just leak down and they don't work anymore. Yeah, mine's a 73. It looks very nice. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Yours might be a mechanical. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. From Q Whipple, um, does, MBNA, does MBNA make a summer thermostat for the 5.6 liter engines? They only make one thermostat. They recommend one thermostat. There's no summer, no winter. As long as your engine's uh, under 190. Fahrenheit normal days, you're fine. Winter and summer. Yeah, but there is no summer and winter thermostat. There's no call for different ones or nothing. Whatever uh, is, uh, if I looked it up, it's probably, I think 85 centigrade is, uh, I'm getting confused with it. Your temperature gauge is, as long as your engine's under 190 Fahrenheit, you're okay. Matter of fact, your owner's manual tells you if that needle goes to the red area, then you should turn it off, turn the engine off, or find out why. But your pointer can go way up there and not hit the red area, and that they say, yeah, it's fine. It's still working. So you don't really don't need summer and winter th thermostats. That's extra work, especially on an SLV8, just to change it out for no reason at all, no reason to do it. I don't okay, know if they make ones. Okay, we have one from James from the Ottawa section, 1986 560 SL. He has condensation from the AC drains on the driver's feet. He says the drain has been cleaned out repeatedly, but after a short period of relief, the problem always reoccurs. Is he uh, on a hot, humid day when he gets out of the car, it, is he, he should see two puddles of water under the car, one from each drain, if one or the other isn't draining. Now, he said they were cleaned. I, I don't know if the guy, what he did or nothing like that. But uh, you get under the, if he wants to crawl in the car after it's been running on a hot day, you know, turn it off, of course, hot, humid day. Uh, it should be dripping out of both hoses. Water should be running out. Constantly. Yeah, that's, that's been the case uh, for a short period of time after the uh, clean out has occurred. And then, you know, I get those two bottles of water and then, um, seven or eight days later, while I'm war driving in warm, humid temperatures, uh, it seems to plug up again and, and uh, the puddles disappear. They, they're not producing uh, anymore. It must have a lot of dust or something in it accumulated, and it, uh, it you know, replugs the holes again after they're cleaned. Well, there is a chamber there, isn't there? That, uh, well, yeah, there's it, a plenum. They're underneath the evaporator, and the, the condensate off the evaporator drips into it, and uh, it should run out those two hoses. 
Right. Uh, if they're plugging up again, you've got there's something in there that, that keeps you know a lot of mud, can we say, <laughs> that is plugging those holes. Because I, I think it's you know a three eighths inch nozzle that the hose is connected to. You're not seeing water on your carpets inside, are you? Or under the carpets, I should say. Well, it, if it drips on my feet, it uh, ends up under the carpets. But that's yeah, okay. That, those drains are something plugging them every time. I, I usually you clean them once, you know, and they're nice and clean. Uh, unless you live in uh, driving a lot of dust with the air conditioning on, you know, and, and it's sucked in there because the older cars don't have a filter. Um, you'll build up mud, you know, in the housing there, and then that'll plug them up. But yours keeps plugging after a while. There's something yes, in there, all I can think of. But uh, take a piece of uh, wire, coat hanger wire, gently poke it up through the hose. Don't push hard, <laughs> poke, poke it in the evaporator. But uh, let's see if you get something out each time, you know, so. Okay, well, I'll just keep on it then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, here's one from my old friend, Mike Greenberg. What is the recommended oil and weight for 560 SL, and what is the best manual to purchase and wear? I've got the manuals, this 107 CD manual, shop manuals available, and then you get your owner's manual. Those are the two things. So the owner's manual has your oil specification in it. Uh, the SLs, I think you, I don't know, those engines, I use like a 1040, good grade, Castor oil or pens oil or you know something like that recommended oil. Uh, there's uh, there's a, a document called FASP Factory of, uh, Approved Service Product product FASP. I have copies of them. I could send you a copy of it. You can go down through there. It tells you which fluid for each device in the car and uh, including engine oil. Uh, matter of fact, just a sidebar here. Uh, Richard Simons did a wonderful presentation on engine oils out in uh, California once. I was with him, we did it together. I have his presentation. I might look it over, maybe we could run through that. Uh, uh, engine oils and, and, and different ones for different older cars and newer cars, you know, what they specify. Like, you know, brand new cars up in the 2000, 2000 on, let's call it. You know, we got variable camshafts in those engines. They must have zero W20 or zero W30 oil. I thought, God, that's awful thin. But that's what's required to operate the camshaft uh, advance and retard operation. If you put a 20W50 in, your engine is not going to work well. And that's why they, they specify those thinner oils. This is a sidebar. Anyway, but uh, your owner's manual should have it, what's in there, what, the correct oil. Okay. Um Question from Ken, does the factory manual on CD include the 280 SL? All but the, uh, the six cylinder engine. Now, if you want the six cylinder engine, I can send you the CD for the 123, which deals with the 280 SE, or 280E, 123 body, but the engine's the same, virtually the same. And I know all about those 110 engines, I've had a lot of them, but uh, that's, Technical information on the six cylinder is available in the 123 one. But the, the uh, these shop manuals I'm talking about on CD are for the American cars. See, American civil cars, they're from MBNA, not from Daimler Benz in Germany. So, uh, but that 280 engine is addressed in the 123 CD, and I'd be glad to you know, put them together and all that. Okay, this is from Robert Alley. And he says, from upon start, my 86.560 SL squeals for about three or four seconds. Belts. How old are the belts? <laughs> and how tight? Band belts. If they're new, tighten them up correctly. If they're old, put new ones on. That's what's squeaking. Okay. Power steering, uh, alternator, compressor. Okay. Jack Doyle asked the question. When are you going to do a presentation for the SL500? Hmm. Oh. Is he talking R129? Yeah. Well, if he's talking I I... R129, I have some experience with him, but not enough to be really definitive. But uh, alongside that, I can give a presentation. It'll be part of my 
uh, recovering a long stored Mercedes Benz that hadn't been run for 20 years. Uh, I had a, a 1991 500, SL 500 that I had 38 miles on it. It sat for 23 years. That's a whole story right there. But uh, and I, that's the only experience I really have with a 129 plus other uh, questions I've answered, you know, and looked up things like that. But I, I couldn't give a more de a definitive one than that. But I'd be glad to give it a uh, try, see if I want to talk about it. Because that one I had, that uh, that car had all kinds of problems that uh, I can go into. So, uh, but uh, the 129s had a lot of evolution all the way from beginning to end. And you can't hardly make a generalization about one part because it's not on another part, or it's different, or an operation different. That was probably the most modified car I've, I've seen. It, it, it wasn't consistent through the years at all. You had to know exactly what you, year you were working on, had the VIN to answer a question on them, even, because the, the top hydraulics were really something on those cars. And this one I had, had 38 miles on it. From the factory, it, it had leaky cylinders. Not only did they leak from age, or what, but uh, it was a nightmare. But we got it working. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a couple of 129s, so uh, I've got a soft place in my heart for them. But uh, you know, this I, let me give a pitch for our survey afterwards. One of the things we ask in our survey is, you know, what kind of topics would you like to see? And I'm personally kind of interested in seeing George's uh, discussion about recovering that the uh, you know, barn fine car. Because I'm doing a barn eight, fine eight car. car. I, I did a 70. One, 450 SEL, what was it? It had air suspension and everything. And I've done several others through the years. That's the earliest one I've ever done. And, uh, and then this 91 500 SL or SL 500, whatever it was, that was an experience. So done a few in between. So I, I'll yeah. put something together for those who are interested. That'd be great. Okay, and let's see, from Rusty Duncan. Um, our our uh, Peachtree secretary, 78 450 SL with 40,000 miles, car will want to stall or hesitate when hot and in traffic, engine is not overheating. That's fuel again. Um, I, I would say uh, try and find real gas first. Make sure timing is right. Uh, that's got electronic ignition. You have to worry about that. But again, it, it's, it's uh, well, the ignition coil could be a little flaky. They they re respond to overheating when they get old because they got oil in them, you know. And maybe it goes, goes there. So I would re replace the ignition coil and the on the ignition side. See if that helps. They're not that expensive, and then. Uh, Again, uh, if, it, if it's idling and it stops, that's different than if it's running at, at some speed, say 30, 40 miles an hour, and it just quits. That's an intermittent, boy, that can, I'd be looking at the coil or ignition there. No, it's, it's you know, when you're going along in, in very slow traffic, uh, it'll just want to hesitate or, you know, you're, you're stopping the car. It doesn't actually stall out, but it'll, it acts like it wants to stall. All right, let's, this is 78, yep. but it's pretty low mileage. Change the fuel filter. Uh, there's a screen in the fuel tank, almost impossible to get it out without a special tool. And uh, Mercedes Source, club member up in Washington, he has a tool to get it out. It might be something in the tank is plugging that screen which will let it run a little bit and then quit. And then you wait a few minutes and it runs fine and then it quits. So that, what we're doing is we're gonna make sure the fuel is, is clean all the way from the tank to the filter. I think your pump is probably okay. Uh, it might be the fuel pump uh, relay. It might change that, I have those too. But uh, let's check, check that fuel. If the fuel filter has uh, not been changed, uh, since new, you say what, 78,000 miles? Yeah, 40,000. 40,000? I put a fuel filter in it. Just put a fuel filter first. Or maybe while you're down there, put in the, the check valve, just a few extra dollars and a little extra time. 
then see what happens. But uh, an ignition coil could be, oh, well, that was pretty young, I don't know. Older cars or coils can get flaky, but uh, for that. Okay. Uh, Jim Hook asks for a 1972 350 SL with 136,000 miles. Are trigger points still available? No. Take good care of them. <laughs> I don't know who has them. Uh, Mercedes, of course, doesn't have them. They're not in the supply anymore. Can't order them. I've tried. Uh, there is a company, I think, makes a conversion but I don't know who it is. I just heard it. I didn't get their name, but you might Google it and see what, uh, what they have. But uh, if yours are okay, take good care of them. Make sure they're clean. But uh, yeah, trigger points are tough. Those older cars. All right, from Phil to everyone, are subframe mounts a do-it-yourself job? Mine is an 86 560 SL. That's a young car to need them, but if you think they're loose, a friend of mine did his. He did his subframe mounts, jacked it up and everything else. Uh, you can do them, it's, it's, uh, be careful, <laughs> but uh, it can be done. You get the parts. But an 86 seems awfully young to have uh, loose subframe mounts. I don't know, maybe it had a lot of bumpy roads or something really wore it out, all I can think of. Okay, Susan asks, uh, does Georgia praise Mercedes-Benz? Yeah, by what? Do you appraise Mercedes? I used to, older ones, but it's been a long time. I mean, I can, but, you know. Okay. Uh, from Ned Bob, what octane do you recommend for an 84 380 SL? What can I recommend? Mm -hmm. What octane? Mm -hmm. I didn't get what part. Um, gas. he's, he's asking gasoline. What, what gasoline octane do you recommend for the car? I use at least 91. If you can find it, or you can find real gas, go to puregas.org. Pure-gas.org. He, he also, he yeah. also asked, can octane be too high? Well, yeah, if you've got, I don't know, 120 octane. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could. I use 93 in my GLK. My son and uncle do 93. But uh, I don't know where you'd buy it. Aviation fuel? I don't know what is aviation fuel. Oh, shit. But, uh. Cell phone. Cell phone. Where else? Call from. Cell phone. Where else? I'm very popular. What's going on? Oh, that's Rolf. Never mind. Okay. Jim Hook asks your thoughts on stainless steel exhaust systems versus the original systems. Uh, they will last a long time, but again, they've got to be installed properly. Remember, when I talked about the how they uh, expand and everything else. And so you got to get it installed properly. Time valve for years was selling them. And I educated time valve on that. He never knew about uh, heating the exhaust system up before you do the final tightening. And uh, so people were complaining that their exhaust system uh, felt a little rough and everything else. They thought it was just because it's stainless. No, it's because it hadn't been installed properly. So you got to install properly with the rubber donuts and, uh, and everything else, but you got to, have it all together and let it heat up and then tighten it because that's when you drive it is when it's hot and and that, that way you eliminate the source of of harshness from the exhaust system but i've ridden in cars with stainless that it wasn't put together and you could just feel it yeah you know, it, it transmits a lot of that harshness to the body because mm -hmm. mercedes-benz engineered a lot of isolation into our cars both the, the drivetrain and the exhaust all hung on rubber if you look at them. Everything is hung on rubber. Okay, uh, Matt Kazendorf asks, what is the procedure to test whether the auxiliary cooling fan is working or not? On a hot day, you can hear it cutting in and out maybe. <laughs> uh, 
driving the car, you know, uh, at certain temperatures, it'll it'll cut in. Uh, what year car was it? Uh, he does not say. Matt, are you still with us? I am. The gears have different controls. It's an '86. Okay. Uh, and I've had. Yeah. Was just... There's a sensor in the receiver dryer that picks up a relay, which picks up the fan, the auxiliary fan, the electric fan. If it's not working at all, uh, check the relay. You know, I've got relays. You know, simple. Some of the stuff's pretty simple. Problem is, relays are hidden. <laughs> you got to know how to get to them. They're, they're above the fuel fuse box there. Thank you. Okay. This question is from Joseph Rubino. And he uses an abbreviation that I don't know, so I'm, I'm going to ask him what it was. It says, "Where could I buy IAC, not the Chinese knockoff?" IAC? Yes. Joe, are you still with us? IAC, IAC. Intermediate. Uh, roll down in the chat. Somebody answered that. It was. Is there? Yeah, underneath there, what IAC? I can't remember. If I roll down, I'll never get back. Yeah, <laughs> well. Idle air control, that's what he means. Yeah. Idle, oh, idle air control? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, very expensive if they're even available. You say what year? Uh, he does not. I've tried cleaning them. They'll stick, with, get carbon in them, they'll, they'll hang up. There's a little piston that moves back and forth. And recently. Give more or less air, idle air and uh, idle air control. Yeah. I didn't know the Chinese were making one. I'm not surprised. <laughs> They're ripping off everybody. Okay. Oh, here's a question that I also have. It says, it's Kirk from Wichita section. He says, I have a 73 350 SL gray market. Uh, you know, I've got a US 73, uh, same issue though. Where can I get information showing the correct size fuses for each slot in the fuse box? I've never found that. I've got it. Mm. It's in the CD. Okay. Is no, it's not I could send him the page if he'd like to see it. Got this is Kirk. For his yeah, I, I would love to see that. it. Yeah, tell him, yeah, send me an email. I'll send you, tells you what all the fuses should be. Yeah, I just want to know, you know, I bought the replacement fuses and, you know, you've got the pink, the white, and the blue. Yeah. And uh, I can't tell specifically which one needs to go with which. I mean, I could yeah. just go out the highest voltage across, but that's probably not the smart idea either. So I just want to put the correct size fuse in each slot yeah. that's all wasn't there a little cardboard card in there a fuse card in there there is and it shows what each one goes to but it doesn't necessarily tell you what size isn't fuse there a, a, but didn't they, they have at the bottom of it there'd be a square and it said mm -hmm. blue and then be a round one that says different color or something like that i will check again but i don't think it was on there because uh, i've got a card here mm-hmm and I want to take it to a shine for everybody. I can certainly email you directly, George. I just ask you Looks to like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. And at the bottom. Oh, well, this is a later car. Yeah. That's a. Uh, uh, well, yeah, send me an email. I'll get you one. I sure will. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Because the Euro cars are no different than American cars, electric cars. Okay. That's good to know, too. I didn't realize that. And that's just, uh, that in itself is going to be helpful. So thank you again. Appreciate it. Glad to help. Okay. Yep. Now, Jim Hook asks, are the monovalves the same for a 560 SL and a 560 SEC? They're all the same from 1982 to 89, all cars, all the same. If you have to replace the insert, make sure you get a Bosch insert. Don't buy those cheap ATC ones from China because you know, you'll just buy another one in two or three months or weeks, whatever. Yeah. Okay, from Jeb Jenning, uh, 56, excuse me, 86, 560 SL, 40,000 miles with a leather interior. Passenger side, passenger seat pleats are starting to bulge outward. The leather condition is perfect. The question, how hard is it to pull the seat pleats back into the under seat structure? Can that be repaired or does the seat panel need replacing? It'll take somebody experience in taking those seats apart and restitching them. They have to take the seat out, take the cushion out, get into it, and uh, you know, 
it, that's done from underneath somehow. You have to have somebody upholstered who knows how to do that Mercedes Benz seats. So I don't know where he lives, but uh, you know, you check around with club members or somebody who knows of somebody who who does that. So. Okay, we have Bill Fisher asking. Said while recently driving 86 560 SL on the highway, the alarm system kicked on. Where does he look? Oh boy. Uh, could be the module, which is underneath the floorboards, I think. There's an anti towing sensor somewhere in the car. Could be bad. The you know, motion of the car, something starting it. Uh, wow. Those, those are so, so many people in older cars, they, they just disconnect the system because, you know, people don't steal these cars. But uh, if you want to have it ready and armed, uh, have it send me an email. I'll see if I can get the wiring diagram. That's all I do is check through it. It's, they're, they're, they're uh, kind of complicated when you, have, when you put them all together. The switches in the door, the switches in every here and there. So. Okay. Be right We're back. Let me take care of something. Be right back. Okay. Talk among let yourself. <laughs> yeah, let me go to my little commercial here. The uh, I mentioned the June 20th event. The next event we're going to have is June 27th. It's a concourse judging school that we were going to do in person, and we've decided to do it only by video teleconference, and we're only going to do 40 people. This is kind of a, a initial time doing this. We've we're coordinating with Pete Lesler to do it right, and he's going to sit in on it. But uh, once we complete that, those folks that uh, got through it and went through the quiz will be able to be certified as Mercedes concourse judges. So I encourage you to sign up for that one. It's not full yet. And that's on Motorsport Reg. Our first in-person event is going to be the 28th of June. So if you're around in the Atlanta area, come by and see the small display we're setting up at the Halcyon development, which is up in Forsyth County. We're gonna have a couple of 300 SLs and a, several other interesting uh, cars. And of course, we'll be there to talk Mercedes and membership and NBCA and all that. So come by and see us. I think it's about from 11 till two, middle of the day, Sunday, June 28th. First in-person event. Might wanna bring your mask, but uh, July 18th, Diana is going to run a concourse detailing clinic. We're going to have that at Mercedes Benz in Athens. Uh, that's going to be an in-person event in their service department, and uh, we will prop. We're talking about doing some type of video uh, part of that one as well. So, uh, okay. if you're in the area, you might want to come to that. And if uh, <laughs> if we put it out virtually, uh, then you'll have the opportunity to do that. All right, back to George. Let me mark where I was there. Okay. Um, this is from Brandon Freed. He says there is a, it says a taking sound. I think he probably meant a ticking sound coming from my 87 560 SL engine. Yeah, that's correct. It's a ticking sound at, at idle. Mm -hmm. How many miles on it? 107,000. He might try a, it's in, in, so it's, it's in the engine, right? Yeah. He might try a, an engine cleaner of some type. Um, what is it? There's several of them available auto parts stores. You add it to your oil, you run it for under like 100 miles, then you drain the oil, then you put fresh oil in it. You might have a sticky injector, uh, a, a sticky lifter. Um, okay. I, I would try the easy part first rather than spending a lot of money trying to figure out what it is. It might just be uh, Thanks. Uh, but cleaning might do. What, what, what brand cleaner would you recommend? Uh, what have I used in the past? I used something with uh, DB that ring a bell of somebody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's good. Seemed good. Uh, good. You put it in your gasoline or you put it in your oil. Yep. Great. Uh, Engine cleaner and uh, like I say, it's it's a high detergent additive, and hopefully that will clean it out. And then you want to change oil, just like they say, when you're done, because your oil is probably full of dirt plus that chemical. So uh, mm -hmm. 
new fresh oil and filter when you're done. Okay, thank you. All right, next one, and uh, Brett Jurek provided a little answer in chat on this one. The question was from Foz. What about seat covers and seat springs? I need new springs for my seats and can't find any. And Brett Jurek mentioned that he got his leather and the horsehair padding from uh, Bud's Benz uh, in Georgia. Yeah, Bud's has access to a lot of that stuff. They're, they're worthwhile. They're good, good people. I've been down there a couple of times. Yeah. So, yeah, they did my top recently in one of my cars. Yep. Yeah, good, good people. They they do great work. Um, they're a great sponsor of the club, so support them. <laughs> yeah, we had this is, several years ago. So. Yeah. This is from Lee Gaiman. How do you remove the speaker grills to put in better speakers? Um, on the SLs, let me think. There might be a tiny screw at the lower end of it. Look, look for it, and then it it's it, uh, hinged at the top, so you you know you'll pull it out. As far as uh, good speakers, uh, I would go to Crutchfield and see what they have uh, in a size that'll fit in there. Uh, just in older SLs, those speakers are pretty well shot, but uh, um, yeah, as I recall, you there's a, one or two screws at the lower edge. You got to get in there and look at it. You'll see them there and uh, pry it up, then you get to the speaker. If you get to it was in there, be sure you uh, use the wires off the speaker that have a little connector that it's with the factory. Keep that factory that way, it's much easier to put, to connect them up again. Yeah, and Brett's holding up 90 watt uh, kicker speakers, I guess he got from Crutchfield. Yeah, okay. I found the Crutchfield yeah. also pr provides good you okay. good instructions on how to change them yeah yeah crutchfield's got good selection of stuff like that so that's usually where i've gone in the past yeah and, and brett pointed out two screws at the bottom edge of the speaker covers yeah that's, okay that's what i thought bill answers uh, bill asks the center air vents on my 87 560 sl are stuck closed any suggestions defrost still works fine he says What was what was closed? Which ones? The center air vents on the eighty-seven five sixty. Well, it's closed. That, that foam piece of uh, foam holes underneath is disintegrated in all these cars. Long ago disintegrated. They replace that foam hose, like I talked about. I can send him how to do it. Okay. Oh, here here's a good chance for a plug, George. Susan asked, "Does George have a website?" Perfanalysis.com. P, the first four letters of performance, so it's P-E-R-F, then the word analysis, A-N-A-L-Y-S-I-S, perfanalysis.com. I guess I didn't put it on the thing. Uh, okay, um, Bill Dormandy um, asked, 88.560 SL with 37,000 miles, cold and warm idle surges up and down about 300 RPM. Also, what all additive would you recommend to relieve sticky engine valves? Engine cuts out on hard acceleration. Well, as far as you're varying your idle, you're probably the idle controller is bad. Idle control module. And that's behind a glove compartment, I think. I have rebuilt units available, but uh, that's probably the idle control module. That's what I would say for surging like that. It's uh, Now, and he mentions en engine cuts out on hard acceleration. Now, that wouldn't be an idle control module, right? Something else? No, no. Uh -uh. On acceleration, I'm uh, okay, assuming it's your fuel system filter and all that stuff is good. I mean, because it's, you're putting a demand on the fuel system. Um, distributor timing, make sure timing is right. Um, I would clean it. Contacts on the ignition module on the fender there. There's one in those cars, 86 and up. Stuff like that. But uh, it's a young car to have those kind of problems. So uh, I'm leaning toward fuel somewhere. Yeah. You also asked about oil additive that you would recommend to relieve sticky engine valves. 
again, the one we talked about earlier, DB makes one uh, uh, Justice Brothers, JB, not DB, JB. Any auto parts store has them. Again, I would give it an engine treatment like that. Any engine oil. Gasoline won't do it. It has to be in the oil. Because <laughs> the gasoline doesn't do it, they inject the uh, lifters. <laughs> I get a kick out. Some mechanic puts stuff in the gasoline to free up sticky lifters. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. SL Diesel Richard in Southern California says he has an odd question. An 85 that has been converted to a diesel, an 85 OM617 from a 300D. Has anyone else know of anybody that's done this? He says he may have the only one. He may have, yeah. I don't know why I'd want to do that, but uh, <laughs> if I cut the value of the car in half, if everyone wants to sell it. But uh, no, I haven't heard anybody that did that. Hey, uh, Sam Catbeth asks, can you please tell us more about the 303 protectorant that you mentioned? What's the full name? Which I think is 303. 303 protectorant. protectorant. Yeah, I wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. And as I mentioned, it's, it was developed for the Coast Guard to put on their rubber rafts that are, you see them on the side of their cutters, you know, and they're out in the sun all the time. So it helps preserve the rubber. But it's good for rubber and plastics. I use it on all the seals and all that stuff. Works well. Okay, Joe, Joseph Rubino has 85 through 80 SL. The seat belt light, seat belt indicator light goes off when it's connected, but it comes back on when he begins to drive for the driver's side only. The seat belt light? Seat belt, seat belt indicator light, yeah. Well, it's just one light, but how does he know it's, it's turned on by the driver's seat or passenger seat? That's what gets me. There's not separate what lights are left and right. No. There's one light. Maybe it's, it, it thinks that somebody's sitting in the passenger seat, but. Uh, Joe Rubino, are you still with us? Uh, there is a contactor in the, in the buckle there on the inside of the seat. Uh, the wire coming out of it, and it connects to a cable there under the seat and goes off. You might check and see if that switch is bad or something, but uh, but it goes out when he hooks it up, then he drives off and it comes on again. I, 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 I'll bet you the passenger seat is doing something there, maybe. Because there's one light, but it'll, it'll light up for either seat or both. Okay. Uh, Steve Schweitzer asked for any recommendation for dash cracks repair or replace or sources. Well, justdashes.com, you have to send it into them. They can recover it. Uh, I've seen covers that go over, you know, they're about $125. If, uh, if you put one of those on, make sure you uh, cut the hole for the uh, little sensor there in the middle of the dashboard. Otherwise your air conditioning system is not gonna work very well. So, uh, so that's another alternative. As far as patching leaks, there's kits you can buy. I don't know how good they are. I've, I've never used them, but uh, uh, that's the only alternative depending on how, you know, how much you want to cover up. But uh, one, of them, one of them, you put this, this stuff on it and you put a, a black screen over it with a, a little heating and you get a little iron with it. But it's like a soldering iron, except it's got a flat plate and you heat it and that melts the stuff right into the existing crack. It's a little kit. I think I've got it out in the garage there somewhere. I never used it. But uh, you might look around and go on, uh, again, Amazon. <laughs> look, look for something like that. There's everything on Amazon. And uh, if you want to try one of those little kits to patch it, get the one that comes with a little iron, a little heating iron. Because that, that, to me, would heat up the uh, patch material and, and make it blend in. So, so the only thing you really have to do is get the color right. Black is easy, of course, but blue or different color may be harder to match. But the point is, it looks to me like the iron might be, the little electric iron would make it uh, melt in, you know, and cover better than just something you put in there and sand it down. I don't know. I have no experience really with a good one. Uh, but 
again, you might Google them and see if people have have uh, experience with those kits. You know, or you can go to the covers; they're available. Or else you can send the dash off and have it uh, re 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 uh, covered. They do Corvettes and they do all kinds of cars. So. Uh, those are Search YouTube. Somebody's done it. <laughs> yeah. right. yep. We've got a couple of comments, uh, discussion about whether the AC compressor in, a, in an 81 3DSL is the same as a Camaro. And uh, Brett Jurek commented that uh, Mercedes bought the compressor from GM, so it's certainly possible. Did you want to comment compressor. on that? Yeah. yeah they, they, they were the GM. The only thing is, if you replace it, you got to make sure the fittings on the back are the right. You got to get the right part number. You know, that's all. But they're they call them a pancake, but uh, yeah, they're the same. And uh, as long as the fittings are the same, they they and you can get those anywhere, dirt cheap almost. Okay, we're getting down to the last few questions here. Gary Semeluk asks, is, is there a problem using the Bardol oil additive for an '87 SL? Routinely or just once? No, he didn't ask that. Is Gary you still there? I mean, Mercedes-Benz recommends you don't need in normal operation. You don't need any additives other than the recommended oils. But as I mentioned earlier, if you've got some sticky uh, lifters or something, a one-time treatment, you know, that cleans the engine and then change oil when you're done. But I wouldn't routinely put it in there. I wouldn't routinely put any other additive. You don't need to. The engines are designed for uh, longevity using the oils they specify. Some of those things may have an adverse effect, especially in the newer engines, uh, especially with, like with variable camshafts, you would not use any additive. Verboten by Mercedes-Benz because it can change the viscosity of the oil, which is uh, the, the Camshaft adjusters depend on a certain viscosity at a certain temperature. And you put those additives, in, you don't know what's going to happen, you know. So I, I would recommend against it routinely. But if, if Bartol is an engine cleaner that requires you to change oil when you're done, that's okay. A one time treatment. Okay. Neil Dick Neon asks driver's side seat bolster is worn through in one spot or replacement panels available? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Uh, you might uh, go to leathereek.com. Maybe they have some kind of a, a treatment to restore it. They have quite a video on restoring seats and the Rolls Royce and this and that. It's really interesting. So you might see what. Uh, a what good upholster, a good a good local upholster. Some of them will can can repair the seats. They'll actually make a piece and sew it in. Yeah. You know. They make it a poster that knows the seats. Yeah. yeah, that they know the seats. Right. It's done, it's done Mercedes seats before. You still have to take the seat cover off, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be cheap. <laughs> yeah. I've done 123 uh, seats and 126, but never a 107. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jeb Joning asked, what's the best way to repair the center brake light housing, which is starting to show cracks? He's talking about an 86. 560 SL, have you had any experience with the 3D printed replacements? I haven't. Uh, first of all, it's probably easier to just buy a new one and it'll be gray and you'll have to paint it. And you can get spray paint to match your car from Tower Paints. They'll make mix up a spray can uh, for your Mercedes Benz paint code. But uh, as far as, okay, I've looked into getting plastic parts done. They said, yeah, you got the program? No, I want this part printed. No, you have to have the computer program that generates that part. Without Because this the printer is run by a computer, digital signals. This signals come off of a, of a part that has, has been, that has all those digital things on it. Is that uh, printed, Brick? Well, who does that? That's great. You're still muted, Brett. I got it. Yeah, no, I was unmuting. I got it from Top Classic Cars in Fort Myers, Florida. And they I do lots of different. Yeah. 
Yeah, they do lots of different 3D parts, really common break things. So like the, the little clips for your visor. That's where you I know, get those my break off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, he, he, made, he made this one too. I have not put oh, it on okay. yet, but uh, they paint it to match your car. You give them your paint coat and they paint it to match your car. Wonderful. That's and a this, good information. And this costs, they charge, with it painted, they charge, I think, $218. Uh-huh. With it, with it painted. Without the painting, it's eighty-five dollars less. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I've got their their stuff here. I've got all their information. I've been buying. Klaus is a really Klaus is a really nice guy. Good, good. I'm glad somebody has taken up that, figured out a way to make parts. I got some I need made. That's good. Okay, I'm just looking through the chat window, and we will try to make this chat window available for you. Uh, so you can uh, refer back to it. There's some answers in here. There's a few size uh, listing on here. Um, and let's see, there's a question. Is from Steve Campanella, is there a resource with detailed instructions with pictures on the location and methods for cleaning the water drainage ports? You mean uh, out of the air conditioning drains? Uh, Steve, are you still with us? Or is that what you're talking about? The AC well. drain? Both those and the, and the chassis drains? Uh, the, the, uh, the pictures that no, I found. I don't, I'll have to look and see. I don't think it's in the, in the chassis manual. But uh, um, I look in the, in the parts catalog and I can see where the holes are. I mean, it's kind of simple. You just crawl into the car and gently poke a wire under there and it cleans them. I don't know what else you can do. Uh, you can replace the hoses if they're rotted away or something. It's just a simple little piece of hose you could get anywhere and and replace them. Matter of fact, there's a, a Mercedes-Benz part number you can order from Mercedes if you want to. It has a a job with. Uh, well, you know what? I would go on see if somebody's done a YouTube video on it. Um, maybe they've done it. Just. YouTube uh, Mercedes uh, evaporator drains. See if somebody's done it. Uh, but just off the top of my head, I've done it. I just crawled in the car, poke a couple wires up there, and then I fixed it. That was it. it wasn't very involved. Uh, if you have, if you have to change the hoses, you'll have to you know squeeze under the dash there and uh, put them in there. Okay. Uh, Neil Dion asks the question. Synthetic oils, question mark. Not in an older engine. I mean, they'll work, but they seek out, uh, uh, if all the gaskets and seals are left over from petroleum oils, you put in uh, synthetic oil, you're gonna get some leaks, period. That's what it is. It's expensive, I mean, if you wanna do it, you can do it, but uh, you just change oil on on the recommended interval, your engine will last forever. Mm -hmm. okay. my, my GLK requires mobile one. That's what I use. But we've got a couple of raised hands, Gary. Yeah, I see those, and we've got a couple questions in chat. Let me go to the raised hands. Robert Stelfox, you have your hand raised. I know, Bob. Yeah. If you're still with us. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Now, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, I don't have the video part on, but uh, I wanted to let George know that uh, 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 Bosch is remaking the trigger points for the uh, 4.5, 3.5 engines. And it's through the European division and historic division and they're definitely if I can I can send him the information uh, I've got the part number and the availability yeah I'd appreciate that Bob. I'll put it in my file because uh, I will uh, I get a question on every now and then that's that's news to me I'm glad to hear that so okay and but the bad part about it is there's still four or five hundred bucks yeah and, you know but you know if and the obvious thing that people should do first is to clean those things 
with you know a, a contact cleaner yeah. of alcohol or whatever and uh, usually that solves the problem but if if not and you want to replace it 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 is a little bit of a job because they just give you the point assemblies and you have to resolder the wires to it which is not impossible it it's not that hard but uh i just you know, I wanted to find out how much it was and how to get it. So they are available. I'll get you the part number and the possible source. Good. Yeah, I'd like to have that. That's a good thing. Yeah. And then the other uh, question that I had is in the chat also, if you don't mind, and that was the cable adjusting mechanism uh, in the back we're going down the road and it sounds like uh, people are shooting at you when that, that thing pops loose and uh these days that's a potential so uh, i was curious if you had an adjusting mechanism or you had talked about changing the cable uh it, it just slips and 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 the mechanism becomes loose or, or it unhooks and 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 your the rear part of your uh, uh, top pops up that that latching mechanism in in and it's the same car you have 280 SL 1980. Well, they're all they're all the same. Yes, yes. All all throughout the all the SLs, but uh, uh, yeah, I I just adjusted mine, but. Uh, a couple there of is there is some sort of an adjustment mechanism <coughs> for that cable, uh, the locking mechanism. Yeah, you just have to look at it, and you see where you can change it. And so when you move the lever, you got to make sure the latch, you know, unlatches completely. It's spring loaded to close. I'm surprised that it went open by itself. <coughs> yeah. You know, it after I lock it, and I'm driving down the road it will, you know, you hit a bump or something and it will, will pop, pop loose. I would look at the latch and make sure number one, it's latching completely. And number That's two- That's what I thought, maybe the latch-, latch has not worn. Yeah, okay. So it would slip, you know, because that, that thing is spring-loaded and uh, it must not have been hooked very, very securely and let it pop loose. you'll get it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, George. Yeah, just send me information. I'll see what I can find. Okay. Okay, well, since we've mentioned uh, cars with trigger points, Michael Gambuza asks a question on a 73 450 SL. Sporadic loping on engine, both hot and cold, replaced wires, caps, rotors, plugs, as he thought it was one of those. But he says he's wondering if it may be a DJtronic issue. When driving and the incident occurs, can be anything from a drop in acceleration to partial backfire, especially when cold. Well, I would clean the, the points, the uh, trigger points, and uh, make sure they're clean and they're, there's no mechanical damage to them. When you look at them, you, you know, you, they're spring loaded. They make them break and uh, make sure that when I'm in bent, I don't know how that would happen, but you know, somebody stuck a screwdriver in there, I don't know. But make sure the trigger points are in good shape, good shape and clean, and then try things out. If you still got it, then uh, you want to start looking at ignition. An older car like that may be the coil um, or, or the ignition system. But the uh, DJtronic computers are almost bulletproof. Uh, rarely fail unless they get water in them. <laughs> okay. We have a hand up from Jeff Gaffney. Jeff, if you're still there, please ask your question. I am, thank you. I'm uh, with the Niagara section, by the way. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes we can hear you well. Okay, good, sorry. And I'm thrilled that you're doing this. I was really happy to see this because I uh, putter around with my cars by myself and it's me in a book trying to figure out uh, when I alternate cars when I get frustrated and I'm back to my SL this year. 
committed to solve this annoying problem. And, and it, it's a great car, runs perfectly on the road, but since I've owned it for years, it uh, does not want to essentially warm up. The idle doesn't want to drop from nine or a thousand down to seven or Here. five. So I'm, you know, and I, I'm thinking oil temperature switch or the pressure. I just found the thing about this, the pressure step switch, which I wasn't aware of before. But the other thing it does is it's a cold start. It has a cold start stumble. And I'm wondering if you think there's, do I have two completely separate problems or could be there be a. What year was it? It's an, I'm sorry, it's an 85 380 SL, sorry. 85 SL? Yeah. There is a cold start system, cold start ejector. Yep. Runs off a timer, which is, yeah, you know, there's a sensor. You have to get the wiring diagram and check through it. You know, I can send it to you, but. Well, I do, I have, I have that, but there's also a mention of an auxiliary air valve. Those two things associated with cold start. Yeah. I don't even know where that, I know where the cold start injector is. That's the idler know. valve, yeah. That's such awesome. you know, those expensive uh, valves that aren't, aren't available anymore, I think. Hmm. But uh, the uh, yeah, that's what I'd look at is is that stuff. The uh, idler, not the idler, but the uh, cold start ejector, uh, making sure it is. Well, it is, there's a relay in there. You you've got the wiring diagram. I'm doing it off memory, but. Uh, something in there that it's, it's not either turning on or it's, it's turning on when it should be turning on and getting extra fuel. See any connection between those two? Uh, are they completely divergent? No, the idle air valve is totally separate. That's run by the idle computer. Idle well, it's not, computer. It, we're not talking about a 1500, a 1500 RPM idle air. It's just, it's like it's warming up and it never warms up. It doesn't drop that 200. It doesn't RPM. drop. So it's got to be like the oil temperature switch, which I think. No, yeah, no. It's, uh, it, it's the uh, idle module that controls that. It gets a temperature input and everything else that drops the idle down. So uh, the one that's behind if the you got the ball. wiring diagrams, check through those. Now, I have those idle modules if you need one, but uh, the, uh, there's something in there. It's not cutting back the idle, you know, cutting back the air. Okay, well, that's... That's my uh, mission. I guess I was just hoping for a magic solution from you today, Lance. No, not not with that, that idle system on it. The, an expensive idler. They used to be about a hundred dollars. Now they're four something. God. <laughs> Seems like every time Mercedes Benz sets out to manufacture an old part, the price has gone up five fivefold or something. <laughs> but I I know. I guess the manufacturer has to retool for it. I don't know they must destroy the tooling or something, so they have to come up with new tooling and then produce it. That's what the, all the cost comes in the tooling, not the production. I know I do a lot of manufacturing too. Sure. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a question from Lee Gaiman. Does anyone know where to get a reasonably priced cup holder to put in the carpeted area under the armrest? I mean, I know Bud's Benz has cup holders. A reasonably priced? Well, I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what he's got. If he's got the ones I used to have, some nice folded up ones that they fold up nice, go either the console or on the door, but they're not available anymore. They're a Mercedes Benz part, even, but they're not available. But uh, I would go with Buds or look on Amazon. I got a pile of them on Amazon and eBay. So find what you know what he thinks will work okay for him is the problem. But, uh, okay. Um. John Trutman has his hand up. So John, would you unmute and ask your question, please? Yes, I just wanted to get the name of the outfit that will do the uh, 3D printing for the third brake light housing. I I didn't catch the name. Uh, I've got, hang on, I'll get it. Yeah, it's Top Classic Cars okay. in That's Fort cool. Myers, Florida. No. And if you go to their, you go to their website, um, let me look real quick. It's top-classic-cars.com. Yeah. And then there's a place where it says um, part store and you click on that and it gives you all the things they have. Okay, Brett, can Thank you? Thank you. I have not installed my, I have not installed my thing yet, it, but it, it looks awesome. So I need to install it still. I only got it recently. Yeah, Brett, can you chat that uh, website into the chat mm -hmm. and that way it'll get captured. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, and John Covington has his hand up. 
You still with us? Yes. Now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a 72 350 slash 450, and I have a fuel odor in the cab and sometimes as, as well as in the trunk. And I've replaced my gas cap, and I still uh, sometimes even experience pressure in the gas tank itself. Could this be a problem with the fuel vapor tank? If not, yeah. where do I start diagnosing? Well, first you gotta pull that bulkhead that's in the trunk to reach the tank. Yeah. Right. Look on the tank is your fume collector and some rubber hoses. Those rubber hoses are so old, the gas fumes are permeating right through the rubber. I had that on my 280SL. Trunk stunk of gasoline all the time, and that's what it was. So I replaced all the rubber hoses uh, on the top of the fuel tank. While you're there, check through, uh, if you don't have the diagram, I can send it to you. The uh, I think that that's a very rudimentary system on it, but anyway, it uh, make sure it's all connected and working well. All right, thank you. Okay, we have a hand up from uh, it says SL Diesel Richard, South Carolina or South California. So you can unmute and ask your question. There you are. Okay, unmute yourself. Well, there you go. Actually, it's not a question, more of a, a, a I want to talk about the uh, GM R4 compressors. I have quite a bit of experience with those, and um, I find that they, they don't last very long, and I found out the reason why is because whenever you buy a rebuilt compressor, um, those, uh, the relationship between the front and the back can be clocked four different ways, okay? And so the front has an oil hole through it. Um, you can kind of see it on the casting on the front. And in most of the GM applications, the uh, hoses to where they're mounted, the, the pad in the back, is on the top. Well, when you put them in the Mercedes engines, it's on the bottom. And so what happens is the oil hole that's on the front casting is facing down and so what happens is the front bearing and seal don't get any oil and then they fail so um, it's important that if you get a rebuilt compressor for your mercedes-benz application that you make sure you uh, clock the rear uh, in the proper or i should say the front in the proper orientation so that when it's mounted on the car the oil hole is facing up so it'll get get oil from from the inside of the compressor and another point when you change the compressor always change the receiver dryer oh absolutely the filter receiver dryer is not only a, a receiver but it and it dries out the, but it uh it's a filter and uh, it's dirty <laughs> change it when you put in a new compressor and things work a lot better matter of fact if I sell a compressor from my supplier, they're only new. Uh, you must buy a receiver dryer and install it or they don't honor the warranty. So, good point. Okay, it looks like we have two questions left in chat. One is from Sam. He asks, do you recommend Redline water wetter on Mercedes from the 60s? He says he doesn't own an SL, but he has two Mercedes spin tails. I use it on any engine. It improves the heat capability, the heat removal capability of the uh, coolant. And the user requisite amount they call for. And uh, it, it gives you a little better margin of, uh, of your cooling system uh, on a hot day. It, it improves the heat transfer from the metal of the, en the engine into the coolant. So it's, it reduces what they call Nuclear boiling, yeah. <laughs> Only a nuclear engineer would answer Only that. Only a nuclear engineer would know that nuclear boiling is departure from nuclear boiling. In yep. <laughs> we had um, that. And the last question that we have is from Alan Pintner, and he asks, 
what are trigger points? And if I had time, I could run downstairs and get some because I've got my old <laughs> set for my 73 450 SL, but <laughs> go ahead. There, well, they're in an EFI uh, engine, they're underneath the points way down. They're inside the distributor underneath everything in the distributor. And those points uh, make and break to uh, fire the uh, injectors. So uh, that's what they do. They make the injectors squirt at the right time. So uh, they're located inside the distributor, way down underneath everything. They look like uh, ignition points too, kind of. Oh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and that's unique to the DJtronic cars. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. only EFI DJtronic. Yeah. Okay, well, that looks like all of our questions. And uh, so I just want to thank you. We've gotten a lot of comments in the chat and some emails already but thanking you for this presentation, George. And so I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this with us. It's too hot to be outside anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let me do a little, little commercial for a couple of our, of our events for those of you that are still with us. Sure. The, the uh, two events I didn't cover that I want to mention to you are in-person events. And they're uh, August 1st, we're going to do a karting event at Lanier Raceplex, which is up in Brazelton across the road from Road Atlanta. So if y'all wanted to come do some karting, I'm going to do a little talk about, you know, how to drive the things. And then we'll do about four sessions in the carts, which is enough for most people <laughs> because they kind of beat you up a little bit. But uh, they, these have, are the best rental carts I've ever driven. They're really fun to drive. Uh, they they really don't have any understeer. They're really quite uh, quite fun, and that's about a hundred dollars per person, with ten dollars more for lunch. Go to Motorsport Registration to register. Uh, the next weekend we're ha having a very unique event, which is uh, August eighth, Saturday. Uh, it's called Urban Survival Training, and it's a defensive driving course with professional instructors. We're doing this at Atlanta Motorsports Park. And we're taking advantage of their wet skid pad and their ice hill, as well as their parking lot. We're really not using the racetrack for this, but it's a one-day event. You drive your own car, and uh, it's designed for essentially teenage drivers that are just learning to drive. But we've expanded it so that any of us adult drivers can take the course. I mean, I highly recommend it. I mean, I'm a very experienced driver. I'm going to take the course again because it's also fun. But uh, I need 10 people to pull this one off. I don't quite have enough people registered yet. And if, it, if you're close enough, I highly uh, recommend you sign up for this one because it'll not only be fun, but you'll learn something that may save your life someday. So that's my little commercial for our events. I'll also mention that we're recording this. When it's done, we'll post it on our, our YouTube channel, which is NBCA Peach Tube. We'll also link to it from our website, which is uh, mbcapeachtree.org or .com. Uh, Diana is our webmaster and done a wonderful job putting all that together. And uh, we're gonna do a survey afterwards. I encourage you to answer our survey and give us feedback about what you like and what you didn't like and give us some feedback about other topics that you'd like to see us address. I know George has this this uh, talk about re uh, recovering a barn find, which I'm personally pretty interested in because I'm doing that right now. But uh, let us know what you're interested in. We'll try to arrange some, some more things uh, that uh, get in that direction. And again, George, thank you very much for doing this. This is fun. It's, it's uh, just enjoyable to talk cars. You don't get the chance to do this when you're sheltering it at home. And uh, I hope I also we can- I enjoy it myself, really do. All right. Thanks, everybody. Let's sign off now. Okay. Bye -bye. In touch. Bye-bye.